I remember it like it was yesterday, even though I can't recall when exactly it happened. To this day, I wonder if there was a rational explanation behind everything that occurred that unforgettable night. My name's Alvin Kozak, and I've spent most of my life exploring remote areas in the United States. I frequently ventured out alone, something that many considered hazardous. This time, I opted to visit Gorman Falls in Colorado Bend State Park, Texas, a place known for its rocky cliffs, dense wilderness, and a magnificent 70-foot waterfall. Upon reaching the entrance of the park, I met Selby Erdang, an adventurous local who, like me, wanted to explore the isolated area. We decided to team up and set off together into the wilderness. Hours after our departure and already deeply immersed in our exploration, we stumbled upon an old campsite. The fire pit had cooled down long ago. However, remnants of torn clothing and shattered glasses scattered on the ground indicated that the area might have been abandoned suddenly. Selby made a quirky joke. Maybe Bigfoot paid them a visit. We both chuckled at the absurd idea. However, a feeling of unease crawled inside me. A rustle of leaves behind us caught our attention. In a snap decision, we picked up some nearby rocks as makeshift weapons for self-defense if needed. We yelled out to ask if someone was there but received no response. That's when we saw it, a creature with an otherworldly appearance. Its height was remarkable standing tall enough to be intimidating with long limbs and a lanky frame. What struck terror into our very core was its head, a deer or stag skull with sharp and menacing antlers adorned its body. Frozen in fear momentarily by this relentless monster lurking in shadows, we realized calling for help would be futile due to how remote our location really was. Our instincts kicked into overdrive and we decided to face the appalling creature. The beast lunged, its freakishly elongated limbs grabbing for us. We fought back with all our might, throwing rocks and debris. Our attempts to injure it seemed unsuccessful despite the numerous hits that should have left a discernible impact. Selby decided to take a gamble. She pulled out a small caliber pistol she concealed in her backpack. Firing several rounds at the creature, it let out a blood-curdling shriek and withdrew into the darkness. Our hearts raced with adrenaline as we tried to come up with a plan. Panic began to infect our thoughts. I couldn't believe what we were experiencing was real at that very moment. What unnerved us the most was having no idea what that entity could possibly do next. In an attempt to regain courage, Selby quipped sarcastically. I thought bullets would surely bring that thing down. I wanted to answer with a witty remark but couldn't find the spirit. Instead, I simply replied, Let's just keep moving. We cautiously started traversing deeper into the park, following our instincts toward our ultimate goal of reaching Gorman Falls safely. The tension increased with every step as we scrambled through thick brush and challenging terrain. Silent but desperate prayers accompanied our every step after the creature reappeared, sporadically taunting us from afar. It would knock branches or rocks, its growling growing louder, as if relishing this haunting game of cat and mouse. As we continued our trek, Selby tried to call for help on her phone, but we quickly realized we had no signal. It was a frustrating reminder that the forest had swallowed us whole leaving us isolated and vulnerable. We glanced at each other in unspoken understanding that powerlessness would not hold us back. Every so often, I scanned the area to see if another attack was imminent. Somehow, we managed to keep moving forward while avoiding further encounters with the creature. Hunger clawed at our stomachs as we scavenged for edible plants along the way. Thoughts of thirst and hunger were momentarily forgotten as paranoia consumed our focus. With each step closer towards Gorman Falls, I could feel the eeriness building up around us. Suddenly, Selby motioned me to the ground. Peering through the dense foliage, 
We saw that creature again, standing by a decomposing animal carcass. Fluids dripped from its stag skull head, its elongated limbs stretching like twisted branches as it devoured its prey. Our instincts told us to avoid the spot entirely and find an alternate route. As we began to backtrack, my foot caught on something tangled in the brush. Panic set in as I struggled to free myself while terrified that any sound would attract our monstrous pursuer. Selby acted quickly, whispering for me to remain calm and cutting me loose with her pocket knife. Once we were free, we rushed through the woods on a different path towards Gorman Falls. Suddenly, thunderous footsteps echoed behind us. It was too close for comfort. We darted behind trees in a futile attempt to conceal ourselves from the creature accelerating behind us. The creature lunged towards Selby with a vicious snarl. Its razor-sharp antlers glistened in what little light filtered through the canopy above. With great effort, she managed to roll out of its path and narrowly escaped being impaled. In those desperate moments, we knew we had only two choices, fight or die. I grabbed a large rock from the ground and hurled it at the creature's head. In a moment of confusion, it staggered as Selby and I barraged it with stones. Its pain-infused scream pierced through the forest, but our short-term victory did not last long. Hunger and rage fueled the creature, driving it forward in aggression. With each swing of its antlers and each swipe of its claws, we found ourselves scrambling to find cover and conceal our movements. Our strength waned but giving up was not an option. Selby fired her remaining rounds at the creature while I fought back with sticks and rocks. After what felt like an eternity of struggle, our persistence paid off. Suddenly, the creature retreated into the shadows. Disbelief swept over us as we stared at each other, short of breath and covered in dirt. While we couldn't confirm whether it was dead or finally dissuaded from pursuing us further, we knew this momentary reprieve allowed us to continue our journey towards safety. With every bit of remaining energy, we reached Gorman Falls only to realize that the challenge wasn't over. Now, we had to scale down the waterfall to get help. Carefully finding footholds on slippery rocks and gripping onto roots, Selby and I slowly descended from the waterfall. Each movement required deliberate thought as one false step could doom any chance of escape. Miraculously, our battered bodies touched solid ground minutes later. Stumbling through delirium and exhaustion, Selby activated her phone's GPS after discovering that signals have been restored. We followed its guidance until we found help park rangers who listened to our encounter in disbelief. In hindsight, even though triumph followed tragedy, there was no denying that our lives would never be the same again. The sight of carnage left by the creature and the sounds of its guttural growls would haunt us forever. We sought solace in the fact that, by overcoming our own fears and working together, we had survived a grisly fate. I walked into the Pine Ridge Reservation, my name's John Tall Bear, just another day visiting my family. The sun shone through the trees, casting a warm glow across the forest floor. Hey, did you hear about that missing person last week? My cousin Frank Turning Hawk asked. I shrugged. People go missing all the time around here. Yeah, but this one is different, said Frank body found mutilated. Never seen anything like it. I don't buy it, I replied. We continued our walk through the woods, joking around and catching up on life. Our laughter filled the air as we approached a clearing near a creek. Suddenly, everything went quiet. What's that smell? I asked as a putrid stench filled our nostrils. We stumbled upon the grisly scene of a body, torn apart and unrecognizable. Frank and I exchanged a look of horror. We need to call for help, Frank said frantically. No signal out here, 
I replied, knowing how remote this area was. I wished we could have called for help, but it wasn't an option here. As night fell, we cautiously made our way back to warn the others. The once peaceful reservation now felt sinister. Large claw marks were visible on nearby trees. Gathering in my Uncle Travis Ghost Horse's house, we shared the horrifying news. Our families listened intently, wide-eyed with fear. Travis spoke up with authority in his voice. Something inhuman stalks these woods. That night, we didn't sleep. Instead, we barricaded ourselves indoors and devised a plan for dawn to find and expose whatever lurked in our land. The next day, armed with rifles and knives, we set out into the forest, determined to restore peace to our home. Our vigilance intensified with every passing step. Finally, a rustling in the bushes. We tensed, preparing for the worst. Out lunged a massive beast, its twisted, animalistic features marred by sharp teeth and claws that could rend flesh with ease. We launched into a fight for survival, our wits and weapons against its primal instincts. The creature snarled at us, jaws snapping as it moved with horrifying speed and agility. Many times it seemed as if we'd be mauled or torn to shreds, but through teamwork we kept it at bay. It let out a guttural howl as it circled us like prey. The creature lunged again, and Frank shot at it. The ricochet of bullets filled the air. In the midst of the chaos, Frank was sliced open by the beast's claws. He crumpled to the ground. My heart shattered with grief and anger as I yelled for someone to grab him while I covered them with gunfire. The rest of our group moved forward to offer assistance, continuing our dangerous dance of offense and defense against such an unyielding foe. A deep sense of dread suffused my soul as I realized we were faced with a monstrous enemy that seemed unstoppable. Yet we persisted, fighting for ourselves our families, and our reservation. With every claw swipe or bullet fired, we refused to give up hope. Even though exhaustion clouded our thoughts and weariness sapped our strength, we came together as a united force, determined to protect those that mattered most. We pushed back against the monstrous creature, trying to buy ourselves enough time to grab Frank and escape to safety. While avoiding the claws and teeth of the beast, we stumbled upon a nearby construction site. Somebody shouted, Let's use this place for cover. Together, we scrambled into the area. I could hear the creature's heavy breathing as it persisted in its pursuit, unwilling to let us go that easily. Why isn't anyone calling for help? I yelled over the chaos. Mike, one of our group members, raised his phone and showed me the screen, no signal. Trapped in this situation without any outside assistance added another layer of dread to our already dire circumstances. But we didn't have time to dwell on it. We needed to focus on our makeshift fortress if we were going to survive. We quickly grabbed any tools or equipment we could find, metal pipes, shovels, and other makeshift weapons, hoping they would be enough to fend off the creature. It lunged at us once more, and we retaliated with everything we had. A violent symphony of metallic clangs filled the air as animalistic rage collided with human desperation. The jagged claw marks that crisscrossed its fur bore testament to the raw, primal power this beast possessed. There was little time for panic or despair in the heat of battle fall back on instinct and hope for salvation. It was pure adrenaline that allowed us to dodge each swipe and continue our counterattack. During a heated exchange, Mike swung a sledgehammer into the beast's torso causing it letting out an ear-shattering shriek. Momentarily stunned, it retreated backward, buying us some precious time. Using makeshift walkie-talkies built from scrap materials, we dispersed around the site, like a pack of wolves circling its prey. 
We made sure always to keep an eye on one another as well as the creature lurking nearby. It paced around, its snarl slowly turning into a menacing grin as it realized that we were trapped in this maze of steel and concrete. There was no escape, and it could smell our fear. In a wild sprint, the creature seemed to vanish, only to suddenly emerge from behind a stack of metal sheets, sending Melissa flying like a ragdoll with a swift flick of its tail. No, Melissa! We shouted in unison, fear gripping us at the sight of our injured friend. The bone-chilling realization that our efforts might not be enough to save us settled in. We continued to fight despite overwhelming odds because giving up meant certain death. As Braun began to fail us, we turned to what had always set humankind apart, our ability to think creatively, to innovate. We formed a plan. While half the group formed a distraction for the creature, the rest would work to construct an improvised trap. Metal rods and cables were salvaged from the wreckage around us, shaped into a giant trap. The bait was heavy machinery rigged up as an electrified cage connected to the site's generator. We lured the beast closer and closer until finally springing our trap, simultaneously activating the electrical current and closing the door on this symbol of deadly power contained within an ingenious prison. It howled in rage as sparks flew across its body while its ferocity became its very own undoing. Watching it thrash about in its struggle for freedom filled me with mixed emotions, relief that we might survive this ordeal but also pity for the animal trapped by human cunning. Eventually, against all odds, we emerged victorious. Gasping for breath and exhausted beyond measure, we huddled together amidst the smoking remains of our battlefield. Hand in hand, we knew that despite everything we'd gone through, even when faced with unimaginable terror, there is power in unity and solidarity. News headlines no longer matter, nor do the legends or folklore we once feared. Now, we stand as survivors, bonded by our experience, and driven to protect the ones we love from any threats that may come. Together we remember Frank and Melissa. Their bravery and sacrifice will never be forgotten. And as for that creature? Its existence remains a mystery to others as its corpse was nowhere to be found when authorities arrived. Whispers may spread about the beast that once stalked us, but survivors know better. We have faced true primal horror and emerged triumphant. And for us, there is no greater proof of our human resilience. This happened to me a few summers ago, when I was invited to join some friends on a hiking trip in the remote Appalachians. My name is Stanley O'Reardon, an ordinary guy who works as a software engineer in the city. The fresh air and physical exercise sounded like the perfect escape from my mundane life. The hiking group consisted of my best friend, Rupert Gauntlet, and our acquaintances Wallace DeWire and Madge Greta. As one could imagine, we exchanged stories about past hiking experiences and shared interesting topics of discussion. It created a sense of camaraderie amongst us. The first day of hiking proceeded without any incident, and we set up camp well before nightfall to welcome the peaceful surroundings that enveloped us. That eerie calmness was soon broken by the gruesome discovery nearby, an abandoned campsite with its tent ripped to shreds, dried blood spatters visible all over the scattered belongings. This shocking scene made it clear that we were not alone in these woods. Putting our unease aside, we decided it was safest to continue along our planned route and report our finding at the next opportunity. But even with our unwavering resolve, we could not shake off the unnerving feeling that something dangerous lurked just beyond our perception. We pressed on deeper into those intimidating mountains, 
conversing less and listening more intently for any mysterious sounds or movements that might prompt concerns for our safety in this vast wilderness. During this tense trek, Wallace received a small cut from a bramble that needed attention. Otherwise, we'd risk infection if left untreated. As he cleaned his wound by the trickling stream, now merely several steps away from where we stood, a sudden reality overtook us as we witnessed an unknown man emerging from behind an ancient tree trunk. Tall and menacingly muscular, with coarse tangled hair cascading down his back like twisted vines, the man had an eerie presence that sent shivers down our spines. He hobbled slightly, yet not enough to slow his pursuit. We were standing directly in his path. Without a moment's hesitation, we abandoned Wallace and the others to their fates, prioritizing our safety over assisting those who needed help. Our frantic run deeper into the maze of trees continued as we heard distant screams signaling the blood-curdling demise of our friends. As we caught our breath, we stumbled upon a concealed entrance to a narrow clearing. The fear began to wash over us like torrential rain when we realized that piles of bones, clothing, and the remnants of shoes were scattered throughout the eerie clearing. Cornered with no escape and racked with guilt for leaving our friends behind, Rupert nervously cracked a joke to lighten the mood but could barely laugh at his own words. The gravity of the situation had taken its toll. With little time left to formulate an action plan before nightfall, we carefully studied our surroundings for any chance of evading those monstrous mountain dwellers who were surely still upon us. They had no intention of allowing us to escape, alive or otherwise. The precipitous cliffs nearby provided us but one grim opportunity for salvation— scale their treacherous slopes, or die trying. With no other choice left, we started climbing, fingers grasping at roots and rocks while fighting off vertigo as the ground shrunk further beneath us. Above the rugged tree line, through the wind and fog that clung to these godforsaken peaks like a shroud concealing sinister secrets, those monstrous beings found us once more. Perched silently on jagged cliffs like deranged birds of prey, they eyed their quarry impassively before making their move. Climbing higher and higher, we tried to catch our breaths. Our hands bled from the sharp stones and roots we clung to, but we didn't dare look down or reflect upon the horror that had chased us into the steep terrain. We saw dark shapes darting in the trees below, men twisted by cannibalism ravenous in their cruel hunger. Suddenly, without warning, one of the monstrous hunters lunged at Rupert from a hidden perch further up the cliff. It sunk its yellow and rotten teeth into his neck, tearing out a chunk of flesh as he screamed in agony. I could hear their sinister laughter echoing in my ears. My heart pounded, and I knew I had to act fast. Overwhelmed with fear, I made a decision that still haunts me. I let go of Rupert's hand, watching in terror as he fell. The cannibals surrounded his lifeless body below us, feasting on him like ravenous animals. As much as I longed for rescue or help, there was no one to call out to, no one who would hear us over the cacophony of wind and distance. Our dwindling strength and lack of climbing expertise created an urgency that only quick thinking could countenance. Soon enough, the cannibals began their gruesome ascent towards me. Determined to avoid Rupert's grisly fate, I noticed a cluster of fallen boulders strewn along a narrow ledge beneath my trembling feet. Using all my remaining strength, I pushed three massive rocks off the side of the cliff just as one cannibal closed in on my position. The impact shattered bones and crushed organs. None of the mountain dwellers survived. Exhaustion and relief mixed together in an intoxicating cocktail. For a moment, it almost dulled my despair and grievous guilt at leaving Rupert behind, my friend gone forever. With no hope of finding help on the mountains, I resumed my treacherous ascent, 
fueled by a singular need to escape the nightmarish desolation beneath. The sun dipped below the horizon, and little by little dark shadows covered the land like an abyssal tide. Somehow, when dawn broke over the mangled trees, I found myself at the summit of the mountain. Exhausted yet grateful to be alive, I pushed away my guilt one final time and looked around. Spread before me was a vast valley untouched by the monstrous cannibals, a haven where I could find refuge and mourn my loss. Desperation and survival had propelled me through that unholy ordeal, and though my friends were no more, I could ensure their sacrifice was not in vain by sharing this disturbing tale, warning those naive enough to wander into the domain of those grotesque devourers of human flesh. As I made my way down towards this newfound bastion of safety, Rupert's desperate eyes haunted my every step. I whispered apologies for their untimely deaths, even though nobody would ever hear them but me, promising to honor their memories by staying alive. It has been years since that harrowing experience. New friendships have blossomed in the shadow of loss. Life has returned to some semblance of normalcy. However, the guilt remains, a painful reminder of choices made in terror. I often look back on that day with mixed emotions. In darker moments, I question if there was another way, a better option that should have been pursued more ferociously. Yet such inquiry yields little consolation. It is a futile dance performed upon an unforgiving stage. Nonetheless, fate affords me a chance at redemption, a prospect set against stark contrast to animate absolution. For now... Armed with knowledge and burdened with sanctimonious purpose, I can issue a clarion call to future generations. Beware! Do not stumble into forgotten valleys where the line between man and monster blurs like a gory mist, where despair lies tangled in the roots and terror strains against the very air. And as I wander down a winding path towards the horizon before me, I whisper farewell to my fallen friends bravest of souls who linger still, frozen in memory's cold embrace. A solitary tear slides down my cheek. It carries with it the vestiges of an awful past that shall never dare return. This happened to me a couple of years ago, in the dense forests of West Virginia. I'm Hank Grimes, a freelance photographer captivated by nature. Seeking solace from a recent breakup, I ventured deep into the mountains to capture its untouched beauty. Little did I know it would become my most terrifying experience. At my first campsite, I met another hiker named Melanie Duncan. An experienced backpacker on her maiden trip to these mountains, she struggled with a torn map and muttered about potentially getting lost. Over a campfire that night, we shared stories of our adventures and bonded over our common love of the outdoors. The conversation was peppered with light-hearted jokes that chased away any lingering sadness from my personal life. The following day, as we continued along the trail, we stumbled upon what appeared to be an abandoned campsite. Strewn clothing and half-eaten provisions littered the area, and there were signs of struggle in the dirt. Melanie's uneasiness grew. She said she had read online rumors of people disappearing mysteriously in these mountains, but had brushed them off as fables. We pressed on cautiously, every rustle making us jump. Sunset painted the sky as we crossed paths with a disheveled man named Isaac Meyer who joined us for shelter at our next resting point. Nights in the woods were serene but eerie all at once. As Isaac stared into the flickering fire, he revealed his reason for being here, searching for his brother who had vanished months ago while hiking this very trail. At first light after a sleepless night, we discovered one of our bags had been tampered with. A pocket knife lay nearby that definitely didn't belong to us. 
Isaac clenched his fists in anger. Those damn mountain people! Isaac recounted sinister tales involving local hunters turned cannibals living off travelers they ensnared deep in these woods. Fear gripped our minds, but we thought it'd be riskier to try and find our way back without Isaac's help. We armed ourselves with sticks and knives, more paranoid with each ominous shadow cast by the trees. Navigating unforgiving terrain led us to a putrid stench. Horrified, we found the source, a decomposing human foot. Our panic increased, nausea and a primal urge to flee fighting for dominance in our guts. Unable to ascribe the event to anything else, Melanie finally admitted she was beginning to believe Isaac's stories. But we trudged on. If all went well, we thought, tomorrow's hike would take us out of these treacherous mountains. As twilight descended once more, I scoured the dark woods for kindling when an enormous figure loomed over me, far too tall and wide to be human, draped in tattered clothing, face obscured by wild hair. Its grotesque teeth resembled rusty nails. Terrified, I scrambled back and fled toward camp where I described the encounter. Isaac's expression darkened while Melanie clutched her hiking pole tighter. Sounds like one of them cannibals, Isaac growled. We gotta move now. Otherwise, we hastily packed before traipsing into the gloom. Unable to articulate my concern that there were others like that man-beast creature lurking nearby, my fear mounted. Suddenly, a guttural yell reverberated through the darkness. An ambush erupted as twisted mountain dwellers charged towards us. Terrified and outnumbered, we fought with every ounce of strength we could muster. Run! Melanie shouted as she swung her hiking pole towards one assailant's head. We sprinted away frantically as other malevolent figures loped after us, dodging fallen branches yet hearing their relentless pursuit gaining ground. Seconds feeling like an eternity of non-stop adrenaline coursing through our veins. Weaving through the trees, sharp rocks jab at our ankles, and unseen branches scraped at our faces. My heart nearly leapt out my chest with each added exertion, but I refused to quit. I couldn't endanger Isaac and Melanie any further. I could faintly hear Isaac's breathing behind me deep gurgles coming from his tired lungs. Melanie was nowhere to be seen or heard, but we couldn't risk stopping in fear of being caught. The forest began to thin out, and we found ourselves approaching the edge of a cliff. There was no choice. We had to face these monsters head-on. Isaac and I prepared ourselves, ready for the impending wave of cannibalistic mountain dwellers. Our clothes ragged, faces smeared with dirt and dried blood. It was then that we noticed Melanie at the base of the cliff, her expression full of rage as she clashed metal against flesh. She had found a way around their approach and was yielding her hiking pole like a fierce warrior, giving no quarter to these sickening beings. Isaac mustered the strength to call out to her, his voice hoarse and strained. Melanie! There's too many. Get out of there. She barely acknowledged us due to her focused struggle. She kept fighting with rapid strikes and loud grunts echoing in the air. She was determined not to become another one of their victims. Despite their monstrous size and strength, it appeared that their grotesque teeth and talon-like nails were their main weapons. Decay lingered on their jagged edges. Every time one fell to Melanie's forceful blows, more seemed to emerge from the shadows. Sensing that our attempts to flee would be futile now that they were closing in, Isaac lunged towards one of them just as it approached him from behind, seemingly catching him off guard. Its body collided with a nearby tree with an unsettling crack, and Isaac fell to his knees, clutching his injured arm. Grimacing in pain, he declared through gritted teeth. We gotta end this now. I nodded in agreement, knowing full well there was no turning back. 
The only way out of this nightmare was to fight our way through. I grabbed a large stone and ran toward the nearest assailant. It seemed to snarl with delight as I approached, like a twisted kind of glee at the prospect of a new meal. Ignoring my fear, I brought the rock down upon the being's head, bones shattered under the force of my strike, and continued fighting alongside Melanie and Isaac. Time had ceased existing. We fought on instinct alone as the twilight darkness began subtly fading into premature dawn. Our violent stand against the advancing horde continued with no end in sight. They were relentless. Those who fell were swiftly replaced by others who crawled from the dense shadows. Our bodies ached with exhaustion when we finally managed to break away from the chaos and found ourselves backtracking along our original path. As we neared our destination, it felt as though an eternity had passed since we first embarked on what should have been an uneventful hike. Just as hope seemed within reach, a guttural voice pulsed through the air. It mattered not that they could not muster words. Their intent was clear enough either way. Outnumbered and with injuries taking their toll, we turned to stare death itself in its terrible eyes. It was then that Isaac took matters into his shaking hands. He glanced at Melanie and me before stepping forward towards them defiantly. With a guttural cry of his own, You will never bother us again! He charged straight ahead, his weakened body using any remaining adrenaline for a final push to confront their leader. The sounds that followed will haunt me forever the tortured screams as flesh was torn and bones cracked under the violence. Melanie and I watched in horror, paralyzed with fear, as the gnarled hands reached for Isaac's throat. We couldn't help him. To do so would mean certain death for all of us. As much as it pained our every fiber, we grabbed one another's hands tightly and ran away from this desecrated forest unseen. Isaac's final brave decision gave us a chance, a chance to survive. We would never forget him or the monstrous dwellers that claimed his life those unforgettable days we spent lost in the treacherous mountains. This happened to me about ten years ago in the dense forests of Chattahoochee National Park, Georgia, where I worked as a forest ranger. My name is Thayer Mercer. My job was mainly to patrol the area, keep an eye on campers, and ensure everything's as it should be. One day during my usual rounds, I noticed something strange. A significant number of trees had peculiar markings on them. They looked like bite marks, but none that I'd ever seen before from any native animals. Unnerved, I decided to report the discovery and investigate further. I contacted my friend and fellow ranger, Paloma Keenan, who shared my surprise and curiosity about the situation. We began going through records of similar incidents or local sightings but found nothing. We took matters into our own hands by asking people working or passing by if they had seen anything out of ordinary in the park lately. A hiker named Corson Atwood mentioned hearing strange noises at night, like rustling and stomping, but chalked it up to wild animals, excited about how life in nature never sleeps. Even with my skepticism, I had an eerie feeling about it all worrying that something unexpected might lay around the corner. In the following days, the animal attacks escalated to a point where humans were injured. Campgrounds had been ransacked, people were injured by unknown causes and there was even a missing person case, one Reynard Shelton who was camping alone near the Mark Trees sector. Now deeply troubled by these events, Paloma and I geared up with rifles for protection and started searching for evidence regarding those tree markings, discovered chewing-like scrapings deep in the forest. It soon became clear that we were not alone, sensing an unwelcome presence lurking nearby. Though difficult to see, 
We observed scales rather than fur on its towering body. It was unlike anything we could have imagined living in these woods. Corson joined us on our mission to find Reynard, bearing arms to defend himself from the unknown beast. As our search intensified, so did the creature's presence, its stomping growing louder in the distance and never quite coming into view. The atmosphere intensified when we stumbled upon a grisly sight, swaths of destruction accompanied by blood-stained remnants and vivid bone fragments. It was apparent that we would not find Reynard alive and well. The creature feasting on human destruction had to be stopped, for our safety and that of all visitors who ventured into this park. Determined to bring an end to this reign of terror, we devised a plan to lure the beast out with bait and shoot it on sight. Our operation began at dusk, ensuring we would have enough light while still taking advantage of the creature's increasing activity at night time. Our plan was set into motion. We obtained the best bait we could think of, a slaughtered pig from a nearby farm. We figured that the scent of fresh blood would attract the creature. We placed it near the marked trees sector, where Reynard had gone missing. Armed with our rifles, we took cover and waited for the creature to show itself. As night approached, we heard rustling in the forest. Corson whispered to us, Are you sure this will work? Shouldn't we call for backup from the town? No, I replied quietly. News would spread and spark panic among the townspeople. Furthermore, we don't want any inexperienced help getting caught in the crossfire. We continued waiting nervously as time seemed to stand still in the forest. Moments felt like hours, but finally, we heard heavy footsteps approaching our position. In the dim evening light, we saw its enormous scaly body with long lizard-like limbs. Its face was oddly human but distorted by sharp reptilian features. We held our breaths as it neared the slaughtered pig. Just as it began to feast on its bait, Corson suddenly lost his nerve and fired his rifle prematurely. The round hit the creature's shoulder but seemed to barely harm it. In an instant, its full attention was turned toward us. Anger flashed in its eyes as it charged Corson with lightning speed. He managed to fire a few more shots while escaping through dense bushes and trees, but there was no stopping this creature in its territory. Paloma and I tried to provide cover fire as Corson dove behind a large boulder for protection. However, our bullets only served to anger the creature more. It lunged at Corson again this time severely slashing his leg with one of its massive claws. Paloma shouted at me to get Corson out of there while she distracted the beast. Despite her bravery in volunteering herself as bait, I knew I couldn't let her stand alone against this monster. We decided it was time to call for help. We were in over our heads, and we needed reinforcements. Corson took out his phone, praying for a signal. Miraculously, he was able to connect to a weak signal and dialed emergency services. Frantically, he explained our situation and location. Meanwhile, Paloma continued shooting at the creature, attempting to buy time for Corson and me. The creature circled her menacingly but seemed hesitant to approach after taking multiple bullets from us. Suddenly, we heard the sound of approaching vehicles breaking through the tense silence. The creature's head turned towards the noise as though it recognized a new threat. It hesitated for a moment before retreating back into the shadows of the forest. Corson's leg required immediate medical attention, and we were soon surrounded by paramedics and park rangers assessing our situation. The rangers informed us that they had never encountered such a creature before but vowed to investigate further and protect visitors from future harm. We later found out that other nearby towns had reported similar events with large scaly creatures stalking or attacking people in forests or parks. 
These frightening encounters led us to believe that this creature was not alone. There may be more like it out there. The incident shook our small community, but we stood strong together in the face of it. We mourned Reynard's tragic death but also celebrated our narrow escape from the inhuman predator. Life returned to normal as days turned into weeks and weeks into months. With increased patrols and precautions taken by park rangers, visitors no longer hesitated to explore our beautiful parkland. As for Paloma, Corson, and myself, we cannot forget what we witnessed in those woods, faces monstrous yet somewhat human-like lurking out there in the darkness of night. I'm Jasper Millstone, a small-town cop with a taste for risk-taking. My friends always joke that it's because of my adventurous parents. They raised me in Independence, Missouri, a quiet town with its fair share of eccentrics. Despite the fun I poked at our town's quirks, my roots here ran deep. It was a day of routine patrols when the seemingly normal investigation into a missing person named Elias Geary kicked off something far darker. His wife, Magdalena, had contacted the station frantic and in tears. Her pleading eyes stuck with me as I followed up on her report. As I drove down the main street, I passed by well-known landmarks, Our Lady of Lourdes Shrine, the Harry S. Truman Museum, an amusing must-visit for school trips, and our prized community theater. Turning onto McCoy Avenue, I scanned the neighborhood before stopping at Elias's last known location, his woodworking shop. Entering the building, I was struck by the pungent smell of varnish. Piles of lumber lay scattered around saws and workbenches covered in wood shavings. Everything appeared undisturbed and nothing seemed amiss, until I spotted a pool of thick blood leading out the back door. The sight made me clench my fists. What happened to good old Elias? With a deep breath, I followed the gory trail out into the woods behind his workshop. Hiking through dense undergrowth and low-hanging branches, grunts and scrapes echoed around me as adrenaline coursed through my veins. Each footstep intensified my resolve to find answers. Nearing the edge of Independence Cemetery, something monstrous hid in those shadows grabbed every ounce of attention within me. Leaves crunched nearby and I instinctively ducked behind one of the older tombstones. Under Ricky Willard's lonely epitaph from 1790, I fought back panic and tried to shake off the dark thoughts creeping into my mind. I reminded myself that nothing stays secret in a small town, yet here I was feeling like a deer caught in headlights trembling and unsure, with something I'd never before encountered lurking around me. Peeking around the protection of the sturdy gravestone, stomach churning, I saw it. A creature not of flesh but of nightmares, its twisted limbs clicking with unnatural motion as they propelled it forward. Towering over six feet tall, bony digits extended from gnarled hands that were more like claws than fingers. The creature's visage was a grotesque cross between a reptile and an insect with wicked fangs and mottled gray skin stretched taut over its gaunt frame. Petrified, I drew my gun as quietly as possible. Then, a hideous screech pierced the air from some distance away. There was someone else in these woods. Gun in hand, I charged through damp soil and tangled vines towards the origin of the sound. A terrified woman stumbled into view, Madeline Hartley local librarian and mother of two. She looked over her shoulder in sheer horror, tears streaming down her face. The creature had her scent, and I could hear it fast approaching. Madeline screamed as it broke through nearby underbrush mere yards from us both. This was the pivotal moment where I had to decide whether to shoot first or call for backup. Without any hesitation, I fired at the creature as it lunged towards Madeline. 
The bullets tore through its mottled gray skin, the impact sending it flying back into the underbrush. It screeched in pain and anger, but continued to move. Run! I shouted, grabbing Madeline's hand and pulling her along with me. We sprinted through the woods, not knowing where we were heading but certain that staying put would be a death sentence. We didn't dare call for help, fearful that any noise might draw the creature back to us. The thought of others becoming hunted like we were was something neither of us could bear. As we stumbled through the dense forest together, branches scratching our faces and arms, we heard the creature's twisted limbs click and snap behind us. It was gaining on us. Suddenly, up ahead I saw a clearing with a small cabin hidden among the trees. Without thinking, I led Madeline towards it and quickly ripped open the door, pushing her inside before following her in and slamming it closed. The cabin was small and abandoned, its wooden walls barely holding up against the weight of years of neglect. I found a rusty old iron bar lying next to an aged fireplace and jammed it between the handle of the door and one remaining sturdy wall to serve as a makeshift lock. Outside, we could hear the relentless clicking footsteps approaching closer than circling the cabin while we held our breaths trying desperately not to make a sound ourselves. Madeline and I exchanged terrified glances. Words weren't necessary when shared fear takes over communication. After what felt like an eternity, but must have only been minutes, the clicking sounds retreated into woods once more. Holding each other up with shaky arms and legs, we carefully began making our way out of the cabin ears perked for sounds from our hunter without needing words to brace each other. As we moved farther away from the cabin, I scanned our surroundings, trying my best to recall the way back to town. The harrowing night had plunged us into a battle for survival, and we were almost out of energy. We could no longer run but pushed forward as quickly as our battered bodies would allow. As we stumbled through a familiar stretch of woods, I recognized the path that led back to town. Relief washed over me and flooded through Madeline, only the weary had the sharpened senses needed to catch that in a face. As we began walking down that path, another scream pierced through the air, this time further away from us. We barely exchanged glances before we knew someone had called for help but only pulled themselves into the nightmarish hunt too. Madeline and I continued forward and emerged onto the streets of our small town. The sun was just beginning to peak over the horizon. It was clear trouble waited for us when whispers of disappearances echoed through wooden walls and between broken hearts. In this town of silence and shadows, secrets couldn't exist because secrecy was not afforded us alone. As we walked solemnly towards her home, supporting each other physically and mentally more than words could ever convey, we didn't speak of what happened or why it did. All we spoke of were apologies whispered by cold wind as Madeline's husband's worried gaze found her and swept her up in his arms desperate for answers he would never be given. I left the two alone with their unbroken fragile connection. Returning home too exhausted to let fear seep in again with news of those who didn't make it back haunting us. Madeline later lost herself to loss her husband falling victim to some unknown disease after searching too long for answers he didn't want. But that was a tragedy saved for another day when morning couldn't provide pain enough focus away from terrible choices made. The truth of what took place that night must never be spoken, only understood by those who touched its edges and were forever scarred in their quiet silence. The creature remains a mystery, lurking in the shadows of our town's nightmares. Those that were lost will be honored simply by remembrance and survival the only choice left to us in their wake. I'm Joseph Kellerman, a small-town cop in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Life was pretty simple until the evening my friend and colleague, 
Clarence Mendel, went missing. Pine Bluff was often overlooked, but we had a quiet community that shared friendly waves and neighborhood potlucks. Being a cop here mostly meant breaking up drunken squabbles at the local bar or finding lost pets. That fateful evening began with a night shift at the station. Apart from the usual handful of reports and paperwork, our days were painfully mundane. My best friend and fellow officer, Mary Beth Williams, was discussing her recent trip to visit her daughter in college when the frantic call came in from an elderly woman named Edna Dooley. Help! Edna gasped between sobs. He's taken him. I saw it happen. Please hurry. We rushed over to Edna's place, finding her frantic upon our arrival. Trembling on her porch, she uttered something about a creature. What do you mean, Edna? Start from the beginning, I urged as calmly as possible. It was horrible, she cried. A towering beast with blackened fur, enormous antlers jutting from its head. It burst through my front door and seized my husband Gilbert before I could react. It gathered him up in its arms like it was nothing and disappeared into the woods. Mary Beth looked at me wide-eyed before giving Edna a reassuring touch on the shoulder as we promised to do all we could to find Gilbert. We gathered other officers for an urgent meeting and decided to form search parties to locate Gilbert. Mary Beth and I took lead along with two others Troy Crompton and Samuel Vichens. Together, we began our search. Armed with only flashlights and firearms for security measures, we ventured into the woods where Edna had seen the creature disappear with Gilbert. Over rough terrain and through dense underbrush, we pressed forward, occasionally calling out Gilbert's name. The woods were eerie and silent that night as if even the animals were watching us closely. Suddenly, we found a door lying in the dirt in the middle of nowhere never had I seen something so out of place. It seemed far too absurd to be real. This must be Edna's front door. Mary Beth whispered in disbelief, her breath fogging up her glasses. But what are the odds it would be lying here like this? The implications sent shivers down my spine. We moved on, with our sense of urgency growing stronger. After what felt like hours in the pitch-black woods, we caught sight of a faint light flickering ahead. As we neared, it appeared to be a dilapidated cabin, poorly lit by a single lantern on the porch. To our horror, Gilbert was slumped on the ground beside it, whimpering. As Samuel stepped forward to help him, there was a massive crashing sound from within the cabin followed by an earth-shattering roar. In an instant, the creature emerged everything Edna described and more. Seeing Gilbert distraught and hurt instantly fueled my fear into anger. I unholstered my gun, but before I could pull the trigger Mary Beth shouted, Wait! As soon as she interrupted me, Though terrified herself, she made some sort of flimsy joke to try to lighten the unbearable tension despite her shaking hands. You don't want to end up shooting Sam by accident. I hesitated, unsure of what to do next. Samuel was on the ground, trying his best to tend to Gilbert's wounds, while Mary Beth frantically scanned the area around us. The creature didn't hesitate, though. It charged straight for us, its massive body covered in a thick layer of fur and glaring, bloodshot eyes staring straight at me. My heart pounded in my chest as I panicked, looking for anything in the surrounding darkness I could use as a makeshift weapon. I spotted a fallen tree branch and made a desperate dash for it, letting go of the gun. Mary Beth grabbed the branch with me and together we swung it at the creature's head with all our strength. It let out an agonized screech and stumbled back momentarily. I could see deep scratches on its face from the impact of the branch. Samuel took advantage of the situation, pulling out his pocket knife and stabbing it into the creature's hind leg. 
The beast roared in pain once again before lashing out with its clawed hand, slicing Samuel's arm open. He fell backward onto the ground, clutching his arm and gritting his teeth from the intense pain. The creature turned its attention back to us, hatred burning in its eyes as it prepared for another attack. I knew that if we didn't leave now, we wouldn't be able to escape or defend ourselves. Run! I shouted urgently at Mary Beth, who didn't hesitate before grabbing Samuel's good arm and dragging him away from the cabin through the thick brush and trees. I followed closely behind them, struggling to keep up with their pace despite my own injuries and exhaustion. As we pushed through branches that whipped across our skin, we could still hear the rumbling growl and crashing footsteps of the creature close behind us. I realized this wasn't something that would be resolved easily no police force or government agency would be prepared to handle a creature like this. My friends and I were on our own in our attempt to flee from it. Following Mary Beth's lead, we stumbled into a hidden cave within the woods. We were panting heavily, and blood from our cuts tripped onto the cold, wet floor. I tried to catch my breath and glance at Samuel's arm worried for his safety. The wound was deep, but he seemed determined not to let it hold him back. Do you think we lost it? I whispered, scanning the dark entrance of the cave for any sign of the creature. Mary Beth shook her head. I don't know. Time passed, and nothing in the cave moved other than our own breathing. Hours later, we cautiously made our way back outside hoping that the creature had given up its pursuit or moved on. We limped together back to civilization, making sure to avoid areas where we thought the creature may lurk. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, we reached Mary Beth's house. Exhausted and mentally drained, we gazed at each other in silence. Our world had changed forever with the discovery of this vicious creature— None of U.S. would speak about it again. There was too much pain associated with it already. Instead, we focused on healing physically and emotionally in private. Eventually, time would allow us to move on from this harrowing experience as best as we could. Mary Beth left her research on Edna behind, no longer interested in uncovering her gruesome past. Samuel slowly recovered from his injuries and went back to work. And I sold my gun. No longer did I feel safe using such a weapon. Each of us carried a heavy burden within us about that night in those dark woods with that horrifying creature, something so far removed from what we knew of reality. It remains unspoken between us and always will be. But from time to time, as I stare into the night outside my window— I shudder at the thought that somewhere out there, that creature still lurks, waiting for its next victims. My hope is that no one else will ever have to experience the nightmare we faced on that fateful journey into those eerie woods. I got home from another tiring day at work. My name is Jared Williams, and ever since I moved to this small town in Oregon, life has been monotonous. Today, my co-workers were discussing the strange disappearances of some locals. In total, six people had gone missing this month alone. The town was buzzing with theories and urban legends. The sun was setting as I took a walk around the neighborhood before dinner. Everything was peaceful the perfect picture of suburbia. The only thing bothering me were those disappearances. One could never be too careful. As I walked past the thickly wooded area, I couldn't shake off the feeling that someone or something was watching me. A twig snapping in the trees caught my attention. It sounded closer than anything could be by accident. My heart raced but my skeptical nature got the better of me. Maybe it was just a squirrel, I thought. Turning down a different street, I greeted Mr. Thompson mowing his lawn, 
He was one of those neatly dressed seniors who somehow managed to prattle on about immaculate hedges while still seeming friendly. You know, he said nonchalantly in between glances. I'm not sure what all these police helicopters are swooping around for lately. I shook my head in disapproval over the gossiping locals turning the missing persons into some thriller show. He chuckled and said, Well, you'd better make sure your doors are locked tonight. Later that evening while relaxing on my couch flipping between channels, an unsettling noise made me jump. It sounded like a muffled struggle taking place outside my window near the woods, then silence. I cautiously peeked through the blinds at nothing suspicious but couldn't help feeling uneasy about it all. That same night the news reported another disappearance. A woman named Elizabeth Cantor had vanished without a trace. Days after her disappearance unsettled residents gathered in front of their houses exchanging theories. Some even mentioned a humanoid wolf creature stalking in the shadows. I laughed off their wild stories until I remembered that peculiar encounter I had in the woods. On another walk, trying to shrug off uneasiness and clear my head, my heart lurched at the sight of scratch marks on my neighbor's front door. What kind of animal could do this? But before I could wonder further... The door swung open revealing a rowdy bunch laughing with bottles in hand. Inside they were hosting a party to lift everyone's spirits. I rejected the invitation and pressed on into dusk. Seeing another instance of police tape fluttering around a broken fence, marked with crimson, made my gut twist. Night after night for weeks I found myself lying in bed listening to unsettling noises echoing from the wooded area outside. One grisly day I came face to face with the main suspect. Or maybe it would be more accurate to say face to muzzle. Before I knew it, the creature was chasing me down with terrifying speed and agility, snarling viciously like the devil's backed wolf that has haunted this town for too long. Running frantically out of pure panic as its blade-like claws ripped into asphalt behind me, even its glinting eyes seemed ravenous for blood. Every aspect struck fear into my being as we carved a dark path through our town. How did nobody see once obscure corners now flooded with light from discarded flashlights left behind during feudal pursuits around rusted benches upon which local stargazers used to sit? The chase escalated at breakneck pace. Street lights above shattered from deafening howls while facets shimmered like slashes bleeding moonlight onto exposed quivering flesh awaiting immolation beneath cruel fangs soon smeared by thick coats of crimson unable to wash away entirely even approaching dawn's rays. Gasping and panting, I felt a burning pain on the side of my leg. I realized I had been injured during the chase. Desperate, I barged through a broken-down shed and hastily fumbled through tools. With no cell phone reception, there was no hope in calling for help. Inching back into a dark corner, watching my blood pool below me, my weapon, a worn-out rusty hammer held tightly in trembling hands. Gritting my teeth, I clung to the hammer and listened intently for any sign of the creature's approach. The pain in my leg stabbed like hot knives with every thud of its heavy footfall, my pulse racing in time as adrenaline coursed through my veins. Rapid panting interrupted only by whimpers of despair echoed off the shack walls, stirring up centuries-old dust motes. Suddenly, the door burst open, revealing the monstrous wolf-like figure. Its matted fur slick with mud and blood, ears flattened against its skull and snarls exposed dagger-like teeth. Its eyes glared down at me with an unrelenting hunger that chilled me to the bone. In that second between life and death, my mind raced over possible outcomes. Could I somehow overpower this beast? No, impossible. It was too strong and agile for me, injured as I was. Would anyone rescue me if I called out? Likely not given how everyone in town fled when they caught wind of what terrorized our streets. 
With no other option in sight, I swung my hammer with whatever remaining strength I had left and struck the creature's paw with a resounding thud. Howling in pain, it recoiled but didn't retreat entirely. Instead, it lunged forward and pinned me against the ground. Gasping for breath and feeling weakness seep into every fiber of my body from the pain in my leg, I feared any ability to fight back would soon slip through my fingers. But with another anguished thought, what awaited those who'd left loved ones behind during their desperate escape, I mustered one final surge of willpower. With all reserves tapped out, I rammed the hammer's head deep into the creature's side. A blood-curdling howl ripped from its throat as it staggered back, collapsing onto a nearby workbench littered with rusted nails. Even in the face of this apparent victory, I couldn't let myself relax. Wrestling myself free from the weight of its fallen body, I scrambled out of the shed and struggled to think of what to do next. My leg's pain threatened to buckle me with each limping step, but my mind raced for answers with dogged resilience. In between my labored breaths, one word arose unbidden, werewolf. As much as it pained me, and however much I'd previously disowned any discussion of folklore, some twisted part of me hoped for someone back in town who could help make sense of it all. Surely there must be someone who knew how such a being could exist but would try not to get caught up in superstitious nonsense? Finally, in hobbled steps that soaked my clothes with sweat and seemed an epic's length, I reemerged onto the town's main street. As if by miracle or predestined fate, a squat figure hobbled out from an alleyway. The man recognized me instantly, and with a look of shared pain, he too bore wounds from an encounter with the werewolf. Our gazes met as we approached one another and exchanged whispered concerns. Neither of us had any idea how to handle the unfolding nightmare, our lives now entwined by some hideous twist of fate. There were so many questions, yet neither had time nor energy left to voice them. Instead, we limped together back into the darkness toward whatever unknown awaited us. Together we would forge ahead, forever changed and united under bonds far stronger than blood. I'm Ronald Dalton, a mechanic working in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Life's been pretty uneventful, not much happening since my divorce. But that very ordinary life took a twisted turn recently during a casual conversation with my buddy and co-worker, Jacob Varnell. As we fixed a broken-down sedan at our shop, Jacob showed me photos of the latest missing persons case. Being something of an amateur sleuth, he loved digging into unsolved mysteries. The missing man's name was Frank Ackerton. You could see fear carved into the corners of his eyes as he stared through his glasses in the photo. The poor guy just disappeared out of thin air, Jacob explained. Days passed and rumors spread like wildfire among the locals about the bizarre disappearances. One day as we walked to work, we stumbled upon Ethel Morgenstern, an eerie spinster from town reputed to have visions of strange events. Watch out for the creature hidden in plain sight, she whispered cryptically before disappearing behind a nearby house. At work, we took our breaks at the rear of the garage near Tommy Romero's old truck where we could enjoy some quietude. Over time, we noticed claw marks on the trees surrounding the area and strange tracks that looked almost canine but larger and somehow more menacing. One dusk while I walked home from work, I heard rustling in the bushes up ahead. As I cautiously approached with my heart pounding in my chest, I spotted clumped hair and tattered clothes caught on a fence post down a deserted path. Fear seared through me as I wondered if this was real or some sick prank. On another occasion, after finishing late at work, Mr. Hamilton, our workshop's supervisor, ended up staying even later than usual 
while fixing some minor interior damages on his car. However, next morning there was no sign of him nor his vehicle. Everything felt eerily quiet. This situation demanded attention, and Jacob finally confessed that his obsession with the missing persons traced back to his sister who vanished years ago under mysterious circumstances. We decided it was time to buckle down and search for answers in the area where the missing had frequented before their disappearance. Late at night, we ventured miles away from civilization, making our way towards a dense forest surrounding an abandoned building, an asylum that closed down years ago due to corruption and abuse. As we moved through the once imposing structure, now adorned by peeling paint and shattered windows, the halls seemed to breathe with the echoes of the lost souls that had once lived there. Suddenly, a guttural growl echoed out from beyond a shattered door on an upper floor. Our hearts pounded as we pushed through and up a rickety staircase only to stumble upon scratch marks on the floor and walls leading to a massive hole chewed through concrete like it was bitten through by a beast. In that room, severed fingers playing cat's cradle with tendons lay haphazardly about. I barely managed to suppress the urge to vomit at the nauseating sight while I watched Jacob turn ghostly pale. We tried but failed to call for help, the cell signal frustratingly non-existent there. But there was no way we could ignore this horror or leave Frank's potential remains unreported. We had to gather whatever evidence we could find before heading back. As we continued deeper into the darkness armed with flashlights as our only companions, something unbelievable caught our eye, paw prints morphing into humanoid footprints that led into an iron door chained shut and padlocked. Believing it connected to what Ethel warned about and wanting nothing more than answers, Jacob gripped his crowbar tightly in sweaty hands as we decided to break open the chains. But as he raised the crowbar high above his head, moonlight glinting off its sharp edges, a shrill scream echoed throughout the asylum. We couldn't believe our ears when we recognized it as Mr. Hamilton's voice. We knew that if we stayed any longer, our lives would be in grave danger. But leaving Mr. Hamilton behind didn't feel right either. As we stood there, thoughts racing, we suddenly heard ominous growling and heavy steps rumbling towards us. We flung the door open and escaped just in time, needing to save Mr. Hamilton before the monstrous humanoid wolf creature caught up to us. We darted down a hallway littered with broken furniture and fallen debris, adrenaline fueling our every move. We hurried down the hallway, desperately searching for Mr. Hamilton. The grotesque growling and heavy footsteps of the creature grew louder as it continued its pursuit. We knew we had to act fast, or this horror would become our shared fate. Mr. Hamilton! I yelled, struggling to catch my breath as we pressed on. A faint reply echoed from behind a door in the distance its voice barely cutting through the growling of the creature following us. It was Mr. Hamilton, the sound of fear palpable in his voice. Jacob and I exchanged a determined glance and sprinted towards where the voice had come from. As we approached, a monstrous clawed hand slammed through a door to our left, its wooden fragments splintering around us. The terrifying sight confirmed our worst fears. We were being chased by some sort of humanoid wolf creature, its fur matted with blood and dirt, large fangs protruding from its snarling muzzle. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. While I knew nothing about werewolf lore or paranormal activity, I had to assume that's what we were facing. We threw open the door we believed Mr. Hamilton was hiding behind and dragged him out into the hallway with us. Come on! I gasped. We have to outrun it. The three of us stumbled forward as the creature grew closer. My breath came in ragged gasps. Any hope for help remained unreachable as there was no cell phone reception in that desolate asylum. 
It became increasingly clear that we couldn't outrun the predatory beast for much longer. So instead, Jacob took charge and motioned us towards an abandoned office. We quickly filed inside, locking the door behind us with trembling hands. We don't have much time, Jacob whispered, panic creeping into his voice. But maybe if we can barricade the door long enough for it to lose interest, we might be able to escape. We rushed to pile furniture up against the door, a ragged chorus of grunts and groans punctuating our heavy breathing. We had created a barrier as the creature relentlessly scratched at the door's exterior, leaving deep gashes in its surface. As the minutes ticked by, the creature's growls grew quieter and further apart. Perhaps, just maybe, Jacob's plan of waiting out our terrifying pursuer was working. With no other options available to us, we huddled together and waited. After what felt like an eternity, the creature's snarls faded to silence, replaced only by soft whimpers. The transformation before us was both astonishing and disturbing as its menacing form slowly shifted back into that of a human being. It was a figure we recognized all too well, Frank's disheveled and disoriented appearance evident even from behind our makeshift barricade. Still wary, we cautiously removed the blockade from the door and approached Frank's quivering form. I couldn't shake the image of what he had become. I had always chalked up werewolves to folklore or fanciful stories in books. Clearly there was much more truth there than I had ever imagined. We supported Frank as best we could while navigating our way out of that sinister asylum. Once outside its cursed walls, we finally managed to call for help and relayed the terrifying events that had unfolded. Although we left that nightmare behind us, we were forever haunted by those harrowing memories. There were additional victims we could have saved if only we had known earlier what awaited us in those decaying corridors their faces forever imprinted in our minds every time we closed our eyes. We remained haunted, too, by the creature that Frank became on those cold moonlit nights when its bloodlust could not be contained, the knowledge that lurking beneath his human facade remained a monstrous being of unspeakable terror. In an instant George swung his weapon towards the creature managing to hit it before releasing his contraption capturing it into one of his traps. Its ear-splitting roars enveloped the night sky as its eyes locked onto mine as though I were its intended target, all alone. With no other explanation at hand but finally having the creature in sight we all came to one horrific assumption. It's not just an oversized wolf, it's a werewolf. Caged and uncaged its eyes remained locked on to mine until animal control arrived for relocation without questioning its origin which left us to hope it was enough which we know in the back of our minds that it would never be. I never thought I would need a break from the city, but here I was driving down the winding road to my cabin in Moreland, Georgia. After a nasty divorce and losing my job at the firm, I needed some time alone to figure life out. My name is Felton Rowley, and this is my story. The cabin sat on seventy-seven acres of dense woodland that stretched far and wide making me feel as though I could disappear completely. An occasional chirping of birds was the only distraction as I walked towards it. I settled in and decided to take a walk around this very quiet environment. The sun was setting behind the trees, casting long shadows across the leaf-strewn ground. Crunching leaves underfoot added an alien rhythm in contrast to the usual cacophony of car horns back home. As days passed by, I noticed increasing uneasiness every time I explored farther into the woods. Maybe it was the solitude playing tricks on my mind, or perhaps something more sinister. I had begun practicing my woodworking skills after finding some tools in one of the cabin's storage areas. 
It provided a much-needed focus to ward off the eerie feeling that seemed to grow each day. That's when I realized there had been no bird songs. A few days later, a ranger named Ephraim Dansby stopped by to check up on me, which seemed to be a customary duty for isolated cabins like mine. He warned me about grizzly bear attacks reported nearby and offered his assistance any time things were too quiet around here. We exchanged phone numbers before he left. One evening while carving away at my latest woodworking project, a loud crashing noise drew my attention from beyond the tree line. It sounded closer than any wildlife should have permitted and filled me with an uneasy curiosity. I hesitated but then picked up a flashlight and cautiously approached where I thought the noise came from. What greeted me was not what I had anticipated. A massive, fur-covered creature, standing stooped over ten feet tall. Its face was contorted with animalistic features, and it spotted me instantly. I knew I needed to get away quickly but found my legs frozen in place, unable to process the reality of what I just saw. Ephraim arrived the next day after receiving my frantic call. I relayed my experience to him, struggling to convey the fear that still gripped me. He listened intently before finally speaking. The locals have called it the Woodland Strangler, he said. Every few years, odd disappearances are reported around this area. Some folks believe it's the doing of that beast you saw. His words failed to settle my nerves. When he left later that afternoon, he supplied me with a revolver and some easy-to-understand instructions on how to use it. Despite the overwhelming anxiety, something compelled me to stay and confront whatever it was lurking in these woods. Maybe it was the need for a life-altering event or a desire to understand that which defied logic. As night fell, I heard those familiar crashing noises again and decided to face this creature head-on. This time armed with my firearm, I ventured towards the source of the sound. With the flashlight in one hand and the revolver in the other, I moved slowly towards the noise. My senses were heightened but my mind was focused on the task at hand, survival. The crashing noises intensified, and soon I found myself standing where I had first encountered the creature. My heart raced as a foul smell permeated the air. I knew it was close. There it was, the woodland strangler, crouched among thick foliage, its beady black eyes glaring at me. Its body was covered with matted fur, its long limbs resembling gnarled branches. It took a step forward, revealing sharp, jagged teeth behind cracked lips. I could not fathom what kind of creature this was or how it had come to exist in these woods. It regarded me with a predatory gaze, as if savoring its inevitable hunt. I raised my revolver, hands trembling from fear and adrenaline. As much as I knew there could be little chance of defeating such a beast, I found solace in having some means of defense. The creature snorted and charged toward me, its monstrous form crushing through the underbrush with unnatural agility. I fired a shot in panic, missing my target by inches. Despite my attempts to stay on my feet and evade its onslaught, it managed to swipe at me with one of its giant limbs, slicing my forearm open. The force of its swing knocked me to the ground, and I struggled to hold on to my flashlight and weapon. Desperate, I fired two more shots as it approached me again. One bullet found purchase in its shoulder, while another zipped past harmlessly. The beast let out an ear-piercing wail but did not halt or retreat. My mind raced for an escape plan as it loomed over me once more. Suddenly, headlights from a vehicle pierced through the night, illuminating the creature's twisted silhouette against the trees. The monster hesitated and was momentarily distracted by the blinding light. Seizing the opportunity, I pushed myself up from the ground and ran as fast as I could back toward the safety of my home. 
clinging to my grievously injured arm. I stumbled inside and slammed the door behind me, just as an indiscernible yet familiar voice yelled out from the vehicle still parked outside. It was my friend Ephraim. He had returned, having sensed that something terrible might occur after our last conversation. He confirmed that he had fired another shot at the creature before it retreated back into the woods. In shock over my encounter, I could not bring myself to call the authorities or seek out any other help. All I wanted was to escape this nightmare, yet Ephraim urged me to stay and ensure that the beast was truly gone. Together we spent days trying to track down any signs of its existence, never going far but never feeling safe. The wound on my arm burned with a peculiar heat, a stinging reminder of the beast's chilling persistence. Eventually, the reality of what we were dealing with set in. Despite our best efforts, we could not locate or understand this monstrous creature for certain. Its motivations were a mystery beyond our grasp, leaving me with an anxiety that would last for years to come. With no other options left and fearing for my life, I sold my property and moved far away from those dreadful woods. Ephraim supported my decision but kept a wary eye on things even after I had left. I would occasionally receive a phone call from him to share news about new disappearances near the area, another horrifying reminder of what had lurked among those trees, and what might still be lurking there today. But soon those calls tapered off making me wonder if either Ephraim found solace in his own way or if perhaps he too became another victim of that dreaded creature, the woodland strangler. Life moved on, but the memories of that haunting time remain ingrained in my soul, a nightmare I have never truly awakened from. I never expected to find myself in the small town of Elmdale, nestled in the remote hills of West Virginia. People here seem to stick to their own, and for a reason, disappearances. Not just any disappearances, though. These were more than random crimes. Elmdale had become known for a pattern of missing persons cases spanning generations. One evening... I found myself in a local bar a dingy establishment that felt out of place in an otherwise quaint village. I struck up a conversation with a few patrons, hoping to learn something about the recent disappearances. One man, Dalton Purcell, reluctantly shared that he had lost his brother years prior in a similar occurrence. We sat down, and Dalton told me his story. His brother, Ellis Purcell, had ventured into the woods bordering the town but never returned. There was no trace left behind, despite extensive searches by local authorities and volunteers just like many other cases over the years. Dalton's tale struck me as interesting in that despite no apparent connection to the victims, he suspected one possible cause an elusive reptilian creature that had been sighted around Elmdale throughout history. The next day I ventured into the woods where Ellis had vanished along with countless others before him. As I hiked deeper into the trees I stumbled upon several fresh scrapes on tree trunks and what looked like claw marks on rocks and mossy banks. While investigating these peculiar marks, I encountered another local man named Walter Kinsley who claimed he knew more about these mysterious markings. Walter confided that he believed them to be the work of the same unexplained creature which had taken his granddaughter three years prior. Together we pushed further into the woods. By now it was dusk, and as shadows grew long and eerie silence settled around us. That's when we found it, a seemingly bottomless pit ring with those unsettling scratch marks on the surrounding rocks. It radiated malevolence that seemed to taint the air. A plan formed rapidly in our minds. We would descend into this pit tomorrow, hoping to find answers to the decades of disappearances and perhaps confront the thing responsible. As I returned to my temporary lodging, 
I couldn't shake the feeling of being observed, as if a sinister presence had latched on to me. On the fateful day we plunged into the abyss, harnesses and flashlights secured. As we descended, our beams catching glimpses of torn clothing, abandoned equipment, even old bones. We knew we were closing in on something ancient and monstrous. Suddenly, around a bend in the pit's shaft, we caught sight of something beyond imagination, a massive reptilian creature with long black claws and rows upon rows of serrated teeth. Its bulging green eyes darted around maliciously as it hissed and spat, lurking inside a cavern wall crevice near unseen human remains. My mind raced. Here was tangible proof of this nightmare's existence, something no one could deny any longer. But what to do now? One wrong move would cost both our lives. There was no signal below ground to call for help. A pull of a trigger or an attempt to flee would be disastrous. I exchanged a fearful look with Walter, a look that implied both terror and determination. But before we could act on our mutually understood plan, the forest above began emitting alarmed cries and gunshots echoed from Wheeling search team above. Others had followed us here. They'd realized what Walter and I found their loved one's abductor was finally within reach. Knowing we couldn't call for help underground, Walter and I silently agreed to make a stand against this creature. If only we had a bit more time, we could have prepared better but the sounds above were getting closer, signaling that the search party had discovered our location. The reptilian creature slithered out of its crevice, revealing its full terrifying form. It was enormous. Its scaly body stretched out at least twenty feet ending in a powerful tail that constantly twitched with anticipation. Its muscular legs showed it could move quickly if provoked. We had to be careful. Walter motioned to me, pointing at the creature's eyes. We knew that blinding it would be our best chance. As it approached us, Walter grabbed a flare from his bag. He ignited it with a striking sound that echoed through the cavern. The creature hissed violently and lunged toward us. Walter threw the flare at its face, aiming for those bulging green eyes, but missed by inches. I quickly grabbed my flashlight and shone it directly into its eyes as it came closer. The creature recoiled in pain, allowing us precious seconds to scramble up the pit wall to safety before our assailant recovered. We could hear the search party approaching. They definitely heard our commotion but were unaware of the danger they were walking into. Folks! I shouted hoarsely, trying to warn them without alerting the creature any further. Stay clear, creature in pit! My voice echoed off the walls of the cave. A confused murmur rippled through the group above as they pieced together what was happening below them. Moments later, two members of our team appeared at the edge of the pit staring down in horror at what they saw. Noticing their stunned faces, Walter didn't waste any time. Toss down your ropes. Now! Walter barked at them. Two ropes dropped down to us as the rest of the team slowly backed away from the pit. Hastily attaching ourselves, we began our ascent. The creature launched itself at us but its massive form couldn't move with precision in these tight spaces. Dangling in midair, we frantically scaled up the ropes as quick as our worn-out bodies would allow. As we rose, Walter shouted instructions to the search party to gather more ropes so they could contain the creature when it eventually tried to escape. By sheer luck and determination, we made it back to the surface. The once frantic search party now worked in measured synchronization, tying ropes across the pit's entrance. The reptilian beast roared and thrashed below, enraged by both losing its prey and being blinded in one eye by my flashlight. Walter surveyed our makeshift operation with grim satisfaction, knowing we'd halted this monster for now. But for how long? As adrenaline wore off and injuries became apparent, 
the team tended to one another. Some had twisted ankles or bruised ribs from their hasty descent into the pit, following our distressed cries. It was with overwhelming relief that it seemed no lives had been lost. Eventually, the authorities arrived and took over the containment efforts. As they cuffed us for safety and led us away from the scene, I glanced back at that cursed pit, a gaping maw leading straight to hell. In those moments before our discovery, it had briefly just been Walter and me against the creature. Now it was out there for all to witness. Questions would follow. What was this thing? Where was it from? Is it alone? Speculation could wait. Exhaustion took hold as I allowed myself to be led away. The team returned home to nurse their physical and mental scars together. Walter and I each kept an aching dread deep inside, that someday this creature or something worse will return. However long that fleeting period of peace might last, we made a silent pact. We'll be there to face the nightmare again, side by side. This happened to me a long time ago, deep in the remote wilderness of Alaska. I found myself alone and far from civilization, living among the beauty of nature in a small, off-the-grid cabin. My name is Kester Bergen, a city dweller who needed an escape. I had spent most of my career as an accountant, working long hours in a cramped office with unrelenting deadlines. I decided it was time to do something radical. I saved up some money, bought the cabin sight unseen, and retreated to a simpler life. The area around my new home was breathtaking. Tall, dense evergreens surrounded the cabin, their branches extending high into the clear sky. A cold mountain stream snaked through the greenery nearby, providing a steady supply of water that proved vital for daily life. As days turned into weeks, I got acquainted with my nearest neighbors, Staunton Renshaw and his wife Fleury. Their cabin was a mile down an unmarked dirt path from mine. With their seasoned knowledge of wilderness living, they kindly helped me acclimate to my new surroundings. One chilly night after dinner at the Renshaw's cabin, we heard something strange. It sounded like an animal roaring or wailing but unlike anything we had ever encountered in these woods. Any idea what that could be? I asked Staunton nervously. He furrowed his brow for a moment before replying. It might be just a bear or wolf call that's echoing differently through these hills. But it continued. Night after night we were unnerved by this unsettling sound. Then one day tragedy struck. Fleury disappeared while picking berries near their cabin. Staunton organized search parties and scanned every inch of our land. She had seemingly vanished without a trace. Concerned for our own safety, Staunton and I decided to venture out together one evening with our guns to investigate the calls we suspected might be connected to Fleury's disappearance. As we ventured deeper into the woods, the air grew colder and the noise seemed to circulate around us, enveloping us in a haunting chorus. My pulse began to race. I could tell Staunton was also edgy. The underbrush rustled behind us. We scrambled and spun around with weapons poised, only to find ourselves confronted by an unfamiliar creature. It stood on two legs like a human, but its body was covered with coarse, dark hair muscular and hunched over unlike any animal indigenous to these woods. Its eyes were black holes, and a sinister guttural growl rumbled from somewhere within its chest. Frozen in place, neither of us dared move a muscle. The creature snarled and appeared ready to pounce or run. As adrenaline coursed through my veins, I thought back about our lives here in these woods and how things would never be the same again. The standoff between the creature and us seemed to last forever, though it might have been mere seconds. It felt as if danger lurked behind every tree, 
and that this woods we once found comfort in had turned against us. Staunton glanced at me, and without a word, we both knew we needed help. The only problem was calling for assistance without provoking the creature. We slowly inched away from it, trying to maintain our composure and avoid any sudden movements. The beast stared at us intently but didn't move. Its hulking form cast an ominous shadow, making it difficult to discern any facial features or emotions it might have displayed. Instead, all that emanated from it was a menacing aura and its deep guttural growl that gripped my chest with fear. As Staunton managed to pull his phone out of his pocket and dialed the emergency number, I kept my eyes on the creature, not daring to break eye contact. If it suddenly decided to attack or flee, I needed to be aware. Hello? We need help. There's an, an animal or something in the woods, Staunton whispered urgently into the phone. The operator asked for our location and details about the threat. We're near our cabin in Maple Hollow. It's big, it's covered in hair. I've never seen anything like it. Realizing we were calling for help, the creature let out a deafening roar that shook me to my core. In an instant, it charged towards Staunton with terrifying speed and ferocity. Run! I yelled as fear took over my body. My legs moved on their own as both Staunton and I bolted toward our cabin, desperate for safety. We could hear the heavy footfalls of the creature behind us, pounding ever closer. Somehow, we made it back to our cabin with the beast hot on our heels. As we slammed the door shut and locked it, the creature barreled into the wooden barrier, its immense strength causing the entire cabin to shake. We could hear the splintering of wood as it relentlessly tore at the door. Thankfully, our neighbors had heard our cries for help and arrived just as the creature began its destruction. They had brought their hunting rifles and immediately began shooting at the monster which elicited screams of both pain and rage. The creature recoiled from the gunfire but didn't flee. Instead, it focused its vengeful attention on our neighbors, some of whom I recognized as fellow searchers for flurry, and viciously attacked them with claws that dug deeply into their flesh. The scene before me was a gruesome cacophony of screams, gunshots, and animalistic snarls. Eventually, driven away by our neighbor's relentless defense, the creature retreated back into the shadows of the woods. The remnants of our once peaceful lives scattered before us, now stained with blood and terror. The authorities arrived shortly after, having received Staunton's panicked call. We recounted our traumatic encounter as best as we could, but there was something about their reactions that led me to believe they were familiar with this malevolent beast. After conducting an extensive search for any trace of Flurry or the creature, they concluded their investigation with no definitive answers. Left only with dreadful memories of our experience and mourning those who suffered horrific injuries in defense of us, Staunton and I couldn't bring ourselves to stay in those woods any longer. In quiet conversations with others involved in this harrowing ordeal, theories were whispered about what we faced, mentioning skinwalkers or shapeshifters as possibilities. But without any true understanding or knowledge of folklore ourselves, these ominous words held little meaning for Staunton and me. We will always be grateful for the bravery of our neighbors and hope that they will heal from both their physical and emotional wounds. As for Staunton and me, we will carry the horror of these events with us for the rest of our lives. And though we may never know what the creature was or what made it prey on us, we can only hope that it never finds another opportunity to terrorize anyone else. I always liked the peace at dawn before the rest of the world woke up. It's when I do my best work, or so I thought until that peculiar morning. 
My name is Elwyn Caswell, just another park ranger stationed at Yellowstone National Park. People think it's all scenic views and postcard moments out here, but the reality isn't always that pretty. That day started like any other. Early hours, thermos in hand instead of the cliched coffee cup, I patrolled the usual routes. Nothing seemed amiss. Even the usual trail graffiti seemed to have taken a day off. What caught my attention, though, was an abandoned backpack at Artist's Point, far from where a casual hiker would leave something behind. I radioed in about the backpack but didn't get a response. Reception is spotty at best in some areas of the park. My backup Remy Hollis and Paige Burnett likely wouldn't be awake for another hour. Finding personal belongings wasn't new, but we had procedures for that. A part of me argued against waiting for Remy and Paige to show up. That's when curiosity trumped protocol. The bag looked expensive, hardly something someone would forget. Unzipping it revealed more questions than answers. A wallet filled with cash no ID and a map marked with areas beyond tourist trails. The scribbles on it made little sense, more like cryptic symbols than directions. That raised red flags about potential illegal activities, possible poaching sites or unauthorized camping grounds. I opted to check the nearest marked area alone. It wasn't far and I had my trusty service revolver if things got dicey. Just brush, rocks and an eerie silence met me there. No signs of human activity whatsoever, yet something felt off. Suddenly there was a rustle in the underbrush to my right. Not uncommon sound yet this time it made me grip my revolver tighter. When I approached to investigate routine work checking for injured animals or startled hikers what awaited me was either. A humanoid silhouette emerged from behind a tree large and lanky with an unsettling gait and skin that seemed wrong, as if wearing something's hide rather than its own. Its face was nightmarish, eyes two pits of void against pallid flesh stretched too tightly across its skull-like face. For sanity's sake, I tried convincing myself it was some prankster in a costume, but no fabric moved like that, clinging to bones as though desperate to escape its own form. I kept my voice steady despite growing unease. Hey! You can't be here without permission. No reply. It just stared in unsettling silence. Realizing backup was beyond communication range. Logic dictated retreat and regroup with proper force numbers, but instincts screamed at me not to show my back to this creature. Instincts won out. The creature charged suddenly with bewildering speed that belied its lanky frame. I fired without hesitation regulations be damned but bullets might as well have been confetti for all the good they did. It bore down on me like some relentless force of nature until instinct took over entirely, aiming for what seemed most human about it, those void-like eyes. My arm recoiled with the force of the shots, but it was pointless. The creature's frame didn't falter. If anything, it seemed to enrage it more. In a matter of seconds, it closed the distance between us. I turned and ran, no thought in my mind but escape. Panic told me no help would come in time. All training on protocol fled from my thoughts as survival instinct kicked in. I darted through dense trees. Branches snagged at my clothes, thorns scraped skin, but I couldn't stop. A glance over my shoulder revealed the creature's strides were unwavering despite the dense foliage, its lean muscles moving in eerie coordination. I remembered a ranger station was nearby, humanity's outpost amidst wilderness and my only hope. Pushing legs harder, lungs burning for air, I made it to the door and slammed it shut behind me. I jammed furniture against it just as a thud hit the other side. Inside the station was Mike, another ranger on duty. What's going on? He shouted, startled by my abrupt entry and frantic actions. There's something out there. 
was all I managed between gasps. He moved for the radio, while I searched for something that could tell me more about this threat, anything related to animals or incidents, but found nothing helpful. The creature slammed against the door again with force enough to make the walls tremble. Mike gave up on the radio. Whatever frequencies we usually used were dead. He mouthed a silent apology. We were cut off from the outside world. We backed into a corner as that thing outside continued its assault. It didn't utter words or sounds that made sense, just guttural noises between impacts that seemed too strong for any animal. Hours passed as we watched daylight fade through barred windows, our eyes fixed on the weakening barrier between us and it. Dawn brought silence, an eerie lack of life from outside these walls. We ventured out to find deep gouges in wood and earth where it had prowled, yet no sign of its figure remained. As search teams examined unusual tracks leading deep into uncharted woods, questions arose. Could this have been an unclassified species driven by desperation or territory? Nothing concrete surfaced in reports or suggestions from experts. Months have passed since that encounter. Trails have been rerouted. Instructions updated for encountering wildlife were revised thoroughly, but not for what I faced that day because how do you prepare for something when you don't know what it is? In the end, we all want to stay safe while coexisting with nature, but sometimes nature introduces variables we're ill-prepared to handle, ones that don't fall neatly into human understanding or existence itself. We can only hope such encounters are anomalies, aberrations unlikely to repeat. But some nights when rustles stir outside my cabin, I can't help but tighten grip on reality, barely daring to guess what lurks beyond human knowledge in those unquiet shadows. Most people think truck driving is just long hours behind the wheel, but for me, it's a passion. The sound of the engine, the solitude of the open road, I'm Rex Halverson, and nothing satisfies me like hauling cargo across the country. I remember when I was driving through the remote stretches of Nevada, which offered nothing but open sky and miles of desert. That day had started like any other, I woke up in my rig, performed my usual pre-trip inspection, and set out to deliver a shipment to a small town tucked away in the southern part of the state. The desolation was both eerie and beautiful. Derelict buildings from a bygone era flanked the highway, and dusty trails led off into oblivion. Just as the sun began its descent, painting the sky with streaks of orange and red, I noticed something odd in my rearview mirror. A car had been following me for an uncomfortably long time. It wasn't uncommon to have company on such lonely roads, but something felt off about this vehicle's persistence. It had no lights on despite the waning daylight. I focused on the hum of my rig and tried to disregard my growing unease, attributing it to fatigue until I spotted an obstacle ahead on the road. It was a car turned upside down, wreckage scattered all over. The scene seemed out of place, too calculated for an accident. With no one else around and no signal from my phone, helping seemed like an automatic action. However, caution pricked at me. If this were an accident, where were the passengers? Something was amiss, and calling for help wasn't an option in this signal dead zone. As I slowed down while approaching the accident, my thoughts raced back to my personal life, to my sister who always warned me about being too trusting, and right then her advice felt particularly pertinent. Stay alert. She'd say with her look that meant business. Ignoring every instinct that screamed at me to drive on, I finally stopped near enough to see that there was blood on the upturned car's door fresh blood that smeared across into the scrubland softened by dusk's shadows. 
I opened my door cautiously and called out into encroaching darkness. Anyone needs help? No answer came back but a chilling silence which felt increasingly uncomfortable. Then movement caught my eye. A man emerged from behind a scraggy Joshua tree some yards away. Large build with a limp in his step. He was coming towards me, not hurriedly but steadily, with something metallic glinting in his hand. The last shards of sunlight caught on his featureless face, no expression but intent clear as he advanced. His physical presence spoke volumes even though his lips remained sealed shut. I retreated back towards my rig. Every scenario flitted through my mind. None ended well if I stayed put. My gut told me this man wasn't here by happenstance. His predatory stride indicated purpose. With the engine still running, I grabbed my phone. No signal. My breath quickened as I calculated my options. The metal object in the man's hand caught the light again. I slammed the door and hit the locks just as he reached my window, his eyes void of emotion. His face was unshaven, skin rough, and sweat glistened on his forehead despite the cool evening air. Blood stained his clothes, suggesting injury or worse. He pounded on the window, the metallic object an obvious knife. I yelled that I had no cash, but my words seemed to mean nothing to him. There was no bargaining, no humanity in his stance, just relentless aggression. I reached for my phone again in a desperate attempt to call for help, praying for just one bar of reception. Nothing. My only choice was escape. Putting my car into gear, I drove off, watching him in the rearview mirror as he chased after me limping until darkness swallowed his figure. At the first sign of civilization, I pulled into a gas station and dialed 911. Police arrived within minutes. I led them back to where I had last seen him. After an hour of searching, they found a body not far from where my encounter occurred, a victim of what appeared to be a roadside robbery gone terribly wrong. The police asked for a description, and I told them everything I could remember about the man's determined stride and his cold gaze. They nodded solemn understanding. Safely back home days later, my mind replayed those harrowing moments with that man whose name tag had caught onto a thorn near where they found the body. It read Dan. It helped nothing knowing this name now. My sister's warnings echoed through me once more as I realized how close I came to possibly sharing that other victim's fate, a fate that was confirmed on news reports with chilling recounts of Dan's crimes along desert roads. The authorities said they were closing in on him, but he remained at large, an uncomfortable reminder that danger lurks where you least expect it. I remember the cool, metal sheen of the steering wheel beneath my hands as I navigated the winding roads through the dense forestry of the Cascade Range in Oregon. This was just another routine delivery for me, Marshall Kent, a truck driver of ten years. The thick trunk stood sentinel along the road, a testament to the isolation I felt every mile I trudged forward. But this particular route had an air about it that made my usual nonchalant regard for remote drives waver. The trees seemed too still, the air too quiet. My only companion was the roar of the engine and the occasional static lace tune wrestling with the radio's desire for silence. I wouldn't have stopped if it weren't for the gnawing sense that something was off with my rig, a subtle shudder in the gears an inexplicable drop in speed. So, there I was, in a forgotten turnout with only my tools and wits. The sun scored high lines across an azure sky as I slid beneath the massive belly of my eighteen-wheeler. Grit and dust from untold roads kissed my cheeks as I inspected underneath. The guts of my truck spread out like a metallic landscape. 
All seemed in order until my eyes caught an anomaly, a jagged tear in one of the hoses. Not normal wear and tear, this looked deliberate. Goose flesh spread up my arms as I wondered who, or what, could have damaged my vehicle so surreptitiously. Clambering to my feet, I surveyed my surroundings more critically. A few meters from where I parked was a cabin enshrouded in thicket. The sight struck me as odd because no recent memory or map bore mention of its existence. Logic told me to hightail back to my cab, lock myself in, and drive to civilization on whatever fumes left in my engine. But curiosity, the kind that peeks at men who spend too long alone on open roads, ushered me toward that lonesome structure. As I approached, silence paradoxically amplified around me. Even bird songs seemed muted against the silent barricade of trees. The door stood askew on its hinges like a crooked grin. Inside, strewn papers blanketed every surface with nonsensical scrawl. Names upon names linked with dates and cryptic notes. Someone's lifetime obsession illuminated under shafts of light smearing through broken panes. Was this someone's work? Their madness? And why did it feel such malice soaked into these walls? A creak cut through silent musings and instincts screamed danger, all hairs on end and a pumping heart begging flight. Shadows congregated where light dared not pierce. Within them lurked a figure, tall and malevolent, his presence demanding stillness from all living things. He stood there at odds with everything natural, his stature too composed for someone who belonged among these forsaken woods. No words came from him. He simply watched, his eyes hollow pits within which no soul stirred. I should have called out for help or sought it myself, but every fiber within told me cell service would be a vain hope here and any move might incite violence from this quiet menace. So back to work beckoned as best defense, the route familiar with distance breeding safety. But before retreat found purchase under footfall, he advanced, a blur guided by dark intent. With quick breaths, I turned on my heel and sprinted toward the trailhead. My car, a rusty blue sedan, offered sanctuary within these woods. Yet, before steps could mark distance, the figure moved with swift grace despite his size. The momentum brought us closer until I could distinguish features under the dim light. Clean-shaven, with square jaw set hard, his eyes a depthless black. The tailored suit clung to his frame mismatched for a trek through dense underbrush or broken branches. His hands by his sides revealed rough skin, and scars testified to past conflicts, a life far removed from nine-to-five norms. Papers from my work, my research into genealogies, long-forgotten histories of families once prominent now faded into obscurity, rustled in his wake but held no interest for him. I also ceased to care, the binders I had meticulously filled for years now reduced to mere leaves in a thrusting gale. Through splits in the canopy overhead, distant stars bore witness to a chase where only one understood the rules. My phone in pocket became useless. Electricity never favored this deep seclusion. Past the cabin's boundaries fervor mounted. He lunged with fabricated finesse, and claw-like fingers tore through cotton to draw lines crimson across my arm. Pain registered but was absorbed into reckless desperation. Forward into shadow and overfallen log, away from imminent threat personified. Our dance between predator and prey found rhythm in snapped twigs and stifled yelps as branches caught clothing and flesh alike progression no longer measurable in feet but chances. The car came into view at last. Keys fumbled yet found their way home to ignite an engine left cold for hours. A final glance saw him poised at forest edge silent as if roots bound him to that spot, unnatural among nature. 
In motion away acceleration climbed as pines blurred into obscurity behind me until certainty coalesced into thoughts coherent. I knew with irrefutable clarity that he, as devoid of humanity as those pitch eyes suggested, was callously carved from violence's own image, a hitman intention clear whose name would likely remain veiled even from those he served. Days passed as wounds turned stiff under bandages applied by doctors who asked questions without answers forthcoming. I spoke not of encounters shaded by moonlight or villains dressed as businessmen lost within places they should not be but contented myself with survival, as many do when grasping at tomorrow's promise. Restoration of arms use became paramount over return to abandoned research, while imagination weaved scenarios each more grim than real experiences endured or possible victims of cruel intent masked behind tailored finery. And while nights drew curtain tight around hours usually filled with slumber's sweet embrace, no respite found shape in memories stained red or faces haunting twilight's glow thereby ensuring whispered prayers sought daylight's mercy instead of shadow's embrace once offered by silent barricade of trees forever marked by the presence of one who hunted without sound. Anyone who spends enough time in the woods gets a feeling for when things are just off. That's where my story began, in the dense and untamed forests of the Pacific Northwest, where fog clung to the pines like an omen. I'm the kind of guy who clocks in at a government facility so secret, maps don't dare to show it, and GPS signals go to die. We dabbled in things so classified that even thinking about them outside of the lab felt treasonous. My name is Harlan Drexler. And this is what happened on a day that started like any other. My work at the facility often involved looking into genetic anomalies, mutations that didn't obey the usual rules of heredity or natural selection. It was routine until we received a sample that wasn't supposed to exist, let alone be lying in our lab. I was tracing through lines of incongruent DNA when my colleague, Lana Keating, let out a stifled shout from across the room. Harlan, look at this! She beckoned me over with urgency, her eyes wide with excitement or fear. I couldn't tell without reading into her emotions. I pulled on my latex gloves and leaned in close to see what was on her microscope slide. What lay there twisted everything we understood about nature. The cells weren't human. They weren't even terrestrial as far as we could tell. Before we could decide our next move, an ear-piercing shrill shattered our contemplation. The facility's alarms were screaming their warnings. Something had breached the perimeter. Panic never solves anything, so I steadied my breath and checked our lockdown protocols while Lana combed through our communication channels for any drop of information. She turned up with nothing but static. Whatever was happening out there had cut us off entirely. We need backup, she declared, but then fell silent, remembering no call for help could cut through this isolation. Without choice, I unholstered my service weapon, a last resort included in our high security protocols, and proceeded to secure our sample within a containment vault. That's when chaos unfolded outside. Faint gunshots punctuated the tense silence between wailing sirens. Lana and I dared a glance outside to see tree branches swaying violently. Something was moving towards us fast. We caught glimpses through the foliage, massive yet deceivingly agile, and nothing about it resembled Earth's catalogue of fauna. Bulky limbs that twisted unnaturally as it moved closer with ill intent. The silhouette seemed ripped not from biology textbooks, but from a nightmarish folklore tale. Keeping level-headed was tough when every creaking branch felt like an omen of demise. What if it's one of our experiments gone wrong? 
Lana conjectured aloud as we both knew deep down how unlikely that was given what we had just witnessed under the microscope's slide. My fingers instinctively tightened around my gun handle in preparation for confronting whatever mythical terror approached. However, amid this petrifying suspense came waves of incredulity because, really, what kind of folklore creature charges government agents? As fate would have it, Another member of our team burst into the lab, heaving and wide-eyed, a situation report hurriedly tumbling out between gasps. Merrick's dead. He spluttered out names unfamiliar but his point gruesomely clear. Something or someone had fatally turned against us. Merrick supposedly took two rounds center mass before being subjected to violence beyond gunshot wounds. More animalistic than methodical and whatever did it seemingly enjoy doing horrendous things to human bodies. With reports flowing in through our spotty radios about mutilations pockmarking the grounds enveloping our secluded station, there was no denying something heinous was stalking us. All humor drained from our throes on survival instincts alone. We carefully edged through corridors bathed in red emergency lighting. This was no longer just another day at work but a struggle against unknown malicious forces thought only imaginary before today's cruel enlightenment. Whispers caught mid-sentence steered us toward the gruesome centerpiece, an unsettling sight made all too real under stark emergency lights. Nerve-racked agents held fast against gnarled doors as woodland abominations flung themselves against frail human defenses a primal struggle between cryptic nightmares and analytical minds. We made it to the barricaded room. Piles of furniture stacked against the door made our fortress. Our radios lay useless. Static was our only reply. We knew outside help was unwarranted. They were ignorant of our existence, sworn to secrecy we were, tucked away in a covert facility. The creature paced outside, each step a thud against the metal door. It stood at least eight feet tall. Long limbs ended in claws that screeched on surfaces. Its breasts came out in grunts that fogged the tiny window at the top of the door. Time passed in heartbeats and stifled whimpers. My colleague, Jensen, peered through a crack between the boards. Blood drained from her face, but she signed to us it had gone, for now. We shared silent nods and got to work, securing our room further with whatever we found. Metal rods, wiring, anything that could fortify our frail sanctuary. Someone mentioned fire extinguishers as weapons if needed. A scream echoed then silence returned, but the reverberating fear never ceased. Stevens had left hours earlier to find food. He didn't make it back. Dawn broke with no concept of days passing. We were prisoners of circumstance rather than time. Water was low and hunger had set in when we heard scraping again at the door. The creature's shadow filled the gap below it. Cries broke out from some of us. One attempted to escape through a maintenance hatch but stopped abruptly. Claws appeared under the door seizing his ankle, pulling him screaming until his voice faded. That was Jackson. We spent harrowing hours with little light and depleting wills when the creature seemed to withdraw its assault. Silence settled heavier than before. Moments turned to a cautious decision, break for an exit or wait for what seemed inevitable death. I urged delay fearing what waited beyond the safety of our walls. The decision saved us when military vehicles surrounded the compound mere hours later, a rescue op triggered by a distress beacon Jensen activated before our radios failed. Soldiers piled in, shots fired between orders barked clear and authoritative. The creature's anguished roar cut above everything before going silent. Later they told us it was a bear, aberrant due to disease, its size explained by a disfiguring growth. Relief felt hollow when mercenary cleanup crews recounted bodies, Merrick, Stevens, Jackson, 
and three unidentified among twisted remnants confirmable solely by crude lab IDs pinned on white coats. The station shut down. We disbanded into civilian shadows carrying memories we agreed would fade into non-existence just like our work there, a bittersweet end where explanation and comprehension gave solace, but not entirely erasing images etched deep behind tired eyes from those fateful days at that isolated outpost where nature rebuked human hubris with feral impunity. I remember lunchtime by the lake being tranquil, a routine escape from the daily workload of a park ranger. While I savored my sandwich, there was no mental preparation for what lay ahead in Redwood National Park. My name is Ewald Bonnet, and I took pride in ensuring hikers' safety and preserving the integrity of these woods. That day, I stumbled upon something gruesome, a campsite abandoned in disarray, belongings strewn about, and an unsettling amount of crimson soaked into the soil. Stranger still was the lack of any calls for help. In my many years wandering these woods, not once had I seen such a scene without a frantic survivor or even a whisper of distress. It seemed whoever had camped here chose silence, or was silence before they could react. Puzzled and on high alert, I keep my radio to report the find, but crackling static was my only reply. The calm before calamity. Later that afternoon, while following a thin trail of belongings into the denser part of the forest, progression became slow. Each step felt deliberate as if the undergrowth itself sensed the seriousness of my discovery and resisted. When dusk settled between trees thick as ancient stone pillars and deep shadows became companions to every rustling leaf, I should have felt fear tighten its grip, yet it was curiosity that drove me deeper. Cresting a ridge cloaked by fog so dense you could taste the moisture in your breath, shapes moved below in fluid silence, figures seemingly made of mist or less solid forms. It seemed improbable. Logic failed to provide rational thought for their presence here. The forest around me appeared alive with whispers. Could these woods harbor such entities? My training was rooted in what I see and hands touch, typically skeptical to tales spun from folks' overactive imaginations within these woods' embrace. But there stood movement that defied logic and sound stilled by an unnatural presence and impossibility before unschooled eyes. The shapes I glimpsed were malformed shadows beneath canopies native only to nightmares, elongated limbs that moved with predatory grace, creatures unclassified by any field guide or nature manual I'd ever studied. My heart steadied by focus and the weight of the firearm at my side protection against bear or cougar, but against this? I spotted them just beyond an old-growth sequoia's reach, monstrous beings tall as men but misshapen with contours all wrong under the moon's glow. A shuffling sound split the silence unexpectedly. What laced with panic spurred me forward before reason could intervene. If y'all are part of some avant-garde hiking group trying new age fitness trends by moonlight— I joked aloud, comedy my defense against encroaching dread. No chuckles echoed back, only that stupefying quiet. In moments where time itself seems hesitant to advance, events unfolded with stark clarity like snapshots illuminating one's fragile mortality amid untouched wilds where mankind is not apex. The shapes jerked towards me with jagged motions like marionettes pulled by invisible strings a macabre dance orchestrated purely for their amusement or mine. My finger rested on cold metal trigger guard shirty while sweat mingled with elements unstirred by Zephyr's unseen grace. You're trespassing on federal land, I stated flatly, words meant for beings that surely lacked comprehension. The truth settled like early morning mist that something ancient woke here tonight, 
something that hunters whispered about over generations predating trails blazed or fires sparked under star charts unfamiliar to navigators past. These guardians or specters moved unseen alongside forestry guardians like myself until one day. My breath came in short bursts. I backed away, eyes fixed on the advancing figures. Their frames were heavy, muscles rippling under coarse fur. Snouts bared with razor teeth, eyes reflecting a malicious intent. The creature stood on hind legs with the posture of a bear but wrong. No bear moved with such predatory grace. I fumbled for the radio at my belt, a lifeline to civilization. This is Ranger Base, come in, crackled the voice from the other end when I pressed the call button. Base, this is Danielson up in Sector 5. I gasped. I need backup. There's, there's something here. What's your 20? asked the voice urgently. Past Old Sequoia Grove, near the North Ridge. Static followed as they attempted to respond. My radio sputtered and died. Batteries drained without reason. Isolation gripped me. With no response or rescue coming quickly enough to face what approached, escape was the only alternative. The creature stalked forward, circling me now. One let out a guttural sound, a huff that vibrated through my bones. They were hunters, these beasts. The largest charged without warning. Its impact against my left shoulder threw me sideways onto the forest floor with raw pain splintering through my arm. The others watched as their companion pinned me down with its weight, claws dug into earth beside my head. Hot breath wafted over my face smelling of blood and decay. It seemed to relish its control before advancing to make an end of me. My mind raced for options none appeared except distraction. I twisted beneath it and shouted as loud as human lungs allowed. Fire! Hoping primal fear of flame might deter them if only for a moment. It worked. Confusion flickered in its eyes. The creature reared back at my sudden outburst giving just enough space for escape. I scrambled up and sprinted without looking back until lungs burned and legs refused another step. The sounds of pursuit faded into quiet once more. Stillness hung with no sense of the horrors that took place moments earlier. Days passed. Others searched for what mounted such an attack but found nothing save tracks that evoked more questions than answers. Massive prints akin to bears yet not fitting any recorded species. A reminder that some things remain unknown within wild depths. I was left with scars, both visible and not. Stories recounted in low murmurs among rangers echoing an animalistic brutality we tried to comprehend but couldn't fully grasp due to its foreign nature. Species undiscovered perhaps or something that defied simple categorization. Life went on patrols resumed amid watchful glances between sentinels of nature's expanse aware now more than ever that we weren't alone that there were guardians or specters among us not just in lore but flesh and blood within old growth sequoia's shadow. I woke up in the middle of the night to what sounded like footsteps. My name is Walter Thompson, and I'm not usually one to frighten easily but I couldn't shake this feeling of unease. My life had been a series of mundane events. I work as a bank teller in La Mesa, Texas, a small town where everyone knows everyone. My heart raced as I cautiously walked down the dim hallway toward the staircase. When I reached the bottom, my phone rang. It was my friend Peter Westbrook. Panic struck his voice as he told me that his wife, Rosalind Westbrook, had vanished without a trace. I tried to help, asking if he'd contacted the police or if she left a note behind. Peter said no clues were left behind and the cops were already at their house. Hoping to calm my own nerves, I volunteered to head over there immediately. 
As I drove through the dark streets of La Misa, I couldn't help but feel like something was going on that couldn't be clearly explained. When I arrived at Peter's house, several police cars surrounded it with multiple officers scouring the area. The detective on this case said Rosalind might be in grave danger. Peter explained with a lump in his throat. That single statement sent chills down my spine. For hours we all searched and questioned neighbors. All fruitless efforts. As evening rolled and everyone began to lose hope. We decided to rest for a moment under an old oak tree near Peter's backyard. His dog Roger wagging his tail nearby. The night provided little solace as we talked about happier times when Rosalind was with us. During our conversation, we heard a faint noise coming from beyond the old oak tree. It appeared just within our line of sight, an abandoned meatpacking plant that had been vacant for years. We never paid much attention to it before. It seemed irrelevant to our day-to-day -day lives. Curiosity peaked. We made our way toward the eerie structure, flashlights in hand. The double doors creaked open as we walked inside, our footsteps echoing off its vast emptiness. After exploring the main floor, something peculiar caught my eye, a dark fluid dribbling down the wall with an odd and metallic scent. It was blood. Our flashlights converged upstairs where a hallway extended deep into darkness. A guttural screech echoed through the building, like a hunting cry. With adrenaline pumping through our veins and fear gripping us tight, Peter and I ventured further to find Rosalind. But so far, every room we checked revealed nothing but rusted machinery and cobwebs. Finally reaching the end of the long hallway, light filtered through a cracked window revealing strange wet spot on the floor beneath it. Peter yelled for Rosalind when I glanced down to see her bracelet lying nearby. Oh no. Then there was movement, a glimpse of an imposing, reptilian-like creature lurking in the shadows. The air grew thick with terror as tension twisted my stomach into knots. This chilling adversary defied explanations from any earthly origin, with scales both grotesquely green and slimy like a reptile. It had an elongated snout filled with gleaming rows of dagger-like teeth, its eyes cold and predatory. Horrified by its existence, I raised my fist to strike at it defensively. Before I could act, Peter pushed me out of harm's way just as the creature growled ferociously. Circumventing any attempt at stealth or gracefulness, each step resulted in snapping twigs under its feet and clashing silverware-like noises from its menacing claws that dug forcefully into the metal walls. We knew fighting this nightmarish monster was not in our cards without assistance or knowledge of what it would take to conquer it. Our thoughts raced for a plan of action. Cornered and desperate, Peter wondered aloud if he could make a Molotov cocktail using the gasoline left in an old nearby truck and some greasy old rags found on the floor. It sounded like a viable temporary solution, so we began constructing it. Peter had quickly assembled his makeshift weapon and revealed it with a wicked grin. Roger barked ferociously in approval, sensing our growing anticipation and intensity. You ready? Peter asked me nervously. Yes, as ready as I can be. I stuttered, my nerves screaming to run the other way. With the Molotov cocktail firmly in Peter's hand, we inched nervously toward the monstrous creature. Roger continued snarling, his teeth bared and hackles raised. Three, two, one! Peter shouted before hurling the explosive makeshift weapon at the reptilian beast. It let out a deafening screech as flames erupted around its scaled body. The acrid smell of burning flesh filled the air, and it thrashed violently. Taking advantage of its moment of agony, we sprinted away from the inferno. With fleeting glances behind me, I noticed that only a few scales appeared burnt or melted. Somehow, it survived this. 
But escaping was our only priority. As we ran, our heavy breathing filled the quiet night air. We couldn't call for help. The only real proof we had that dangerous reptilian creature was something scarcely believable by any sane person. Ducking into an abandoned warehouse nearby, we attempted to collect our thoughts and figure out what to do next. We need another plan! I gasped between breaths. We were now no longer on offense but defense against an incomprehensible abomination. Peter concurred. This thing seems almost alien, he whispered hoarsely, his voice trembling with fear. With our limited options and resources dwindling by the second, I pulled out my phone and attempted to access any information on this life form. How to defeat it, if it had any weaknesses or if others had encountered something similar. But my frantic searches provided no answers. Silently nodding in agreement, Peter retrieved a crowbar from one corner of the warehouse and handed it to me. Our new course of action, immediate escape at all costs. As we began navigating through dark alleys and back streets, Roger's incessant barking signalized its return. The creature had found us again, its large claws clicking menacingly, and its eyes reflecting the dim light from the streetlights above, watching our every move. Keep going! Peter shouted as we struggled to evade the pursuing beast, using every ounce of adrenaline we had left in our veins. The chase seemed endless, but eventually we stumbled upon an open manhole leading to the sewer system, our last resort. Desperate measures led to desperate action, as Peter and I descended into the dark depths of the stench-filled underground. Roger followed suit, managing to jump down on his own. For hours we trudged through knee-deep filth, encountering rodents and an assortment of unsavory creatures. But the creature never followed. Perhaps it knew better than to squeeze its massive frame into such a confined nightmare. As we emerged from a manhole on the outskirts of town at dawn on the final day, our bodies were exhausted but our determination alive. We knew this thing was unstoppable for now. Something had to be done. As exhausted survivors with limited knowledge and options, Peter and I finally made a difficult decision. It was time to leave town and hopefully outpace this abomination before it could strike again. We left behind a letter at a nearby police station detailing every detail of our harrowing experience. We hoped that by doing so, it would spare someone else from a similar fate or inspire researchers to find answers about this horrifying creature. In the end, all we knew were questions and uncertainties. The creature's origins, weaknesses, or even purpose remained undiscovered. All that remained was our escape plan, leaving everything behind in search of respite from this terror. Indeed, we hadn't defeated it, we merely bought ourselves some time. Cold air bit at my cheeks as I stepped out of the ranger station, firearm holstered to my side, ready for another day on the job. My name's Dalton Russell, a search and rescue officer for the United States Forest Service. This might seem like just another ordinary day, but I assure you, it's far from it. Looking back, I had no idea about the nightmare that would unfold. The radio crackled to life interrupting my thoughts. Hey, Dalton, there was a report of some odd activity near Lake Lillian in central Washington. Could you check it out? Sally's voice came through on the other end. Yeah, sure thing, I replied, hopping into my truck and heading toward the site. The drive proved long and uneventful as I passed through dense forests and winding roads. Eventually arriving at the lake, I was met with an unnerving sight. Trees were uprooted and flung haphazardly around, while claw marks adorned their trunks. Something big had passed through here. At that moment, 
a fellow officer named June approached me wearing a puzzled expression. Dalton, is it just me or do these markings look unnatural? I couldn't resist chuckling at her comment. Well, unless Bigfoot got a hold of some steroids, unnatural might be an understatement. However humorous our exchange may have been in that moment, our laughter soon faded as we stood in awe at the extensive damage before us. Fueled by curiosity and concern, June and I trekked further into the forest to investigate. As we progressed deeper into the woods with great cautionary steps, it soon became apparent that this wasn't just some random animal wreaking havoc on the environment. Something else was going on. We came across a small clearing with an abandoned campsite torn to shreds. Tents were ripped apart and unrecognizable, as if they were nothing more than scraps caught in a weathered storm. A nauseating stench filled the air as we discovered remnants of the previous inhabitants, remains of humans that had been brutally altered. June's face whitened as she surveyed the scene. Dalton, what could have done this? The truth eluded me, but one thing was apparent. Our new foe didn't operate by any logical or natural rules. As I stooped down to investigate closer, a sharp hiss from behind snapped my attention back up. Slowly turning, my eyes locked onto it, a creature like nothing I'd ever seen before. Standing almost ten feet tall with coarse fur and an elongated snout lined with jagged teeth, the beast emitted an aura of malevolence that begged no defiance. The thought of calling for backup flickered through my mind, but I knew it would be futile. We were just too far away from civilization. I tightened the grip on my gun and took aim at the creature. Despite the intensity of the situation, I couldn't help but let out a weak chuckle as I turned to June. Looks like Bigfoot got a hold of some steroids after all. Taking a few steps back from the massive creature, June and I tried to hold our ground. The beast let out a deafening roar that echoed through the trees, leaves shaking around us. Together, we knew we couldn't handle this ourselves. But who to call? It was too dangerous to call our friends or co-workers as they would undoubtedly meet the same fate as these unfortunate campers. June, we don't have time. Let's get out of here and then we can find help, I said urgently. She nodded in agreement, and we began to backtrack away from the gruesome scene, keeping a cautious eye on the monstrous creature looming at the edge of the clearing. Somehow knowing our intentions, it snarled and lunged toward us with a surprising speed for its massive size. Dodging the attack by mere inches, we broke into an all-out sprint weaving through trees, branches whipping at our faces as we hoped to outrun or outmaneuver our pursuer. We could hear its heavy breaths and pounding footsteps just behind us, giving us no reprieve as panic set in. As we rounded a bend, I spotted a narrow crevasse between two large rocks, a potential hiding spot. June! In there! I shouted and pointed as I ran past her. June hesitated for just a moment before following me inside. We crouched low in the tight space with bated breaths, willing our racing hearts to slow down in case it could hear us over its labored breathing. Listening closely, we could make out its snorts and growls but had no clear line of sight through the small opening. The agonizing minutes felt like hours until finally, the noise gradually faded away. Somehow, our hiding place had worked. Cautiously crawling out of the crevasse after what seemed like an eternity of silence outside, June and I scanned our surroundings to make sure the creature was indeed far away. We need to get back to town and warn people about that thing, June whispered urgently, her voice cracking with fear. I nodded. Agreed. But we also need to keep moving. If that thing was able to track us before, it could come back at any moment. During our frantic retreat, we had lost our sense of direction but knew that we needed to head east to get back to town. Occasionally stopping to listen for any sign of the beast, we moved swiftly through the forest, 
finally reaching the outskirts of our peaceful hometown hours later. It was late in the night, but adrenaline still coursed through our veins. We decided there was no time to waste and went straight to the police station, explaining the horrific situation and destruction at the campsite. While met initially with skepticism from the officers, my insistence on the severity of the situation and a visit to the campsite ourselves convinced them of the very real threat looming over our town. As quickly as possible, a search party organized by law enforcement began combing through the forest in pursuit of the creature. June and I stayed close to one another in a separate group tasked with informing neighbors and friends about the danger. A few days passed without a trace of that terrifying beast or news from those who ventured into the forest after it. Rain washed away any tracks it might have left behind while more search parties were called off due to wild weather conditions. Innocent animals and young kids played in puddles like ordinary rainy days. Eventually, life returned to normal again or as normal as possible with whispers of an indescribable horror lurking just outside of town, some even blaming wild animal attacks for those who didn't return from their hunts or campouts in that area ever since then. Vigilance remained though so did gradual forgetfulness as time went on and people settled back into their routines. But June and I could never forget. The memory of that terrible creature and those it had claimed lived on in our hearts, an eerie reminder of how fragile life is and that some things will remain unknown or misunderstood in the depths of this vast, mysterious world. I took the fire lookout job for the solitude, for a sanctuary away from the buzz of the city. My tower stood in the lush expanse of the Smoky Mountains, a landscape I thought benign. This particular evening, marooned in my wooden perch, a shiver-inducing silence crept over the forest. A radio crackle broke through, an unknown frequency. Clem, I whispered, unsure how I knew the name belonged to its owner. Report. Only static replied. Days went by without human contact. While gazing through binoculars one sunset, movement caught my eye, a being, picking through the underbrush. It seemed like a man but moved like an animal, stalking silently. In town during my resupply run, I mentioned it to Jasper, who ran the supply shop. He looked away quickly and handed me an extra flashlight. For emergencies, he said tersely. The next night brought a gruesome sight, deer carcasses at the forest's edge, each looking like a canvas of violent brush strokes rather than animal remains. Shock cemented me to my window until sunrise chased away darkness, and my courage returned with light. The following days were charged with foreboding as if storms brewed just beyond sight. Tension soared when a hiker named Arlene arrived, fleeing from something ghastly she struggled to explain. Human-like but wrong! Her voice trembled as starlight cast an eerie glow on her petrified face. Sleep became a luxury I could no longer afford, chains of heavy eyelids pulling me deeper into fatigue yet alertness laced every dream. Even breezes sounded alarm bells while leaves brushing each other resembled hushed conspiracies. One dull afternoon, I found Jasper's flashlight flickering without reason. As dusk painted shadows inside my cabin, resolve fortified within me, tonight I'd confront whatever hunted these woods. Booted feet ground against earth's carpet as I descended from my tower, Arlene's whimpering trailing behind. We reached the clearing where deer met their end days ago, empty now save for one new addition, Clem's radio beside torn scraps of fabric. A deep breath steadied me before venturing forward but then, movement mirrored mine from behind foliage, calculated and sentient in execution. The creature, that not man, peered back with eyes that knew predation well. 
Words became lost to us then, fear smothering voices as it had done with laughter days past. My companion clung to my arm as we beheld our antagonist, a being driven by primal needs yet curiously methodical in its pursuit. Arlene gripped me tighter. The knot-man moved. Taller than a bear, it stepped free from the trees. Its limbs were long, with claws like knives. Skin, dark and matted with forest debris clung to its frame. It had eyes that shone with intelligence, a cruel knowledge of this game of chase. We understood then, we were prey. Without words, Arlene and I turned back towards my tower. The distance seemed impossible now. Every sound magnified our panic. I resisted the urge to look back as branches cracked behind us. Instead, I focused on reaching my radio. That was all that mattered, calling for help. We made it inside and bolted the door just as the creature hid it from outside. Splinters flew but held for now. Arlene found her voice first, choking out the call sign to rangers miles away. Our relief was fleeting as silence fell, broken by a scream from below, short, guttural, then a sickening silence again. I knew the voice. It was Clem. Rangers responded at last. Backup was hours away, too many miles between us and them. We could only wait, hope that daylight would drive the creature off again. As dawn broke, so did the silence outside. The knot-man retreated into shadows from which it had emerged days before. When backup finally arrived, we came down to an unsettling quiet, no sign of Clem or the creature that had stalked us through the night except for deep grooves in bark and earth. In reports filed later, no one had answers, just Clem's name added to a list of missing persons. We knew something had been out there with us in those woods, but no one else would believe, or couldn't fathom, what we'd witnessed. The forest returned to a precarious peace, quiet enough to make you forget, if only for a moment, that not all predators walk on four legs or are known to man. Night had descended on the Shasta Trinity National Forest, where I, Cleo Marcus, stood watching a fire lookout tower. Bent on safeguarding the vast expanse of woods below, my gaze often caught glimpses of wildlife scurrying in the underbrush, or the occasional hiker making their way along the worn paths weeks into my solitary tenure. The forest sounds and sights had become familiar like distant relatives you learn to live with but never quite know. This night was different. It carried a heaviness that settled in my chest, a whisper of something amiss. I had the horizon for smoke or any signs of fire but found none. Instead, my attention kept drifting to a series of odd reports that had surfaced, unexplained damage to campsites and hikers belonging seemingly torn apart by an animal yet with a precision that suggested human malice. A knock on my cabin door jerked me from my reverie. I opened it to find Lana Barrett, an off-duty sheriff's deputy and a friend from town. Her arrival was nothing if not timely. Her past swordfish fishing adventures always made for animated conversation. That night, however, she wore no smile. Her expression mirrored the worry gnawing at my mind. We found something, she said curtly before leading me down the trail she came up on. As we walked, she described finding what remained of a hiker's campsite, gears shredded apart, food supplies scattered and half-eaten in a grotesque manner. But this animal acted with what seemed like malevolent intention rather than hunger or territorial aggression. We reached the site. It was horror laid bare. In lieu of an animal's chaos was methodical destruction, with punctures in nylon as though measured out by careful fingers rather than teeth or claws. What could enact such calculated damage without a trace? Guilt enveloped me. 
I should have seen something from above, heard an unheard plea for help. It didn't take long for tension to ripple through our small mountain community, as more incidents cropped up, each seemed more violent than the last but with no bloodshed or tracks to follow. The impossibility of any local fauna being responsible dawned on me slowly but certainly. One night as dusk turned to pitch black under a new moon sky, it happened. A clamor shattered the night's quietude, thuds against wood that echoed up to my lookout posts, deep and resonant even against howling wind. From down below peered two glints resembling eyes, reflecting faint moonlight piercing through dense pines. The creature's gaze lockstepped with mine as if assessing me. It stood erect with feral agility, not any known beast but resembling man vaguely, too vague to be one. Retreating to my cabin and barricading myself in seemed prudent. Lana would check in every morning by radio after all, but tonight had thrown caution out alongside good sense. I had stocked the tower with minimal comforts. Some meals ready to eat Lana joke tasted better left uneaten and just crucial survival gear. It seemed painfully inadequate now facing this unknown predator silently demanding entry after stalking its way into our collective psyche. The creature moved closer, stepped silent on the forest floor. Its features clearer now, long limbs, a gaunt frame covered in matted fur, and eyes that bore intelligence, malice. I froze behind the barricade of my cabin door, heart pounding. Communication was key. I reached for the radio but static greeted me. The storm must have damaged the lines. Frantic thoughts raced. Lana would notice my absence come morning, yet that offered no comfort now. The structure shook as the creature slammed against it. I pushed furniture against the door, each movement calculated to maximize the barrier's strength. I heard glass shatter a window giving way to the onslaught. I considered escaping through the back but knew the forest better than to attempt flight in darkness against the creature born from its shadows. Then Lana's voice crackled through the radio, a sliver of hope. Tower 4, do you copy? Lana, I whispered, send help. Detailing my predicament was unnecessary. Urgency laced my plea and Lana understood. The line went dead before she replied. Hours succumbed to silence and anticipation grew unbearable. Suddenly a flare illuminated the woods, a signal from rescuers approaching. The creature recoiled from the intrusion of light, its form retreating into darkness before disappearing entirely. Morning broke with authorities at my door and paramedics attending neighbors injured during their sleep blessedly alive yet marked with strange lesions. In the end, explanations remained elusive. Only theories surfaced of an undiscovered predator acting with brutal intelligence, a living enigma stalking our quiet mountain retreat. We survived. Community bonds strengthened through shared ordeal. But tranquility had fled, leaving behind a wary respect for unexplained dangers lurking amidst nature's beauty. I had never heard silence quite like it. The stillness of the whole rainforest, disturbed only by the occasional rustling of leaves or distant snap of twigs underfoot. That's what I kept telling myself it was, anyway. My name's Saxton Dale, a fire lookout assigned to the Olympics in Washington State. You learn to enjoy solitude in this job, but that night was different. It felt as if the serenity was suffocating me. I got into this line of work to escape debts, ex-wife, a past I wasn't proud of. Up here you don't just watch for fires, you keep tabs on your thoughts too. I was settled into my tower when I heard an unfamiliar noise. Not an animal, more mechanical, rhythmic. Tapping. 
I strained my ears against the fabric of the night to pinpoint the sound but instead met a thick wall of quiet. My only companion up here was Carson Delaney, another lookout from a neighboring peak some miles off. He was an old-timer, preferred books over people, said conversation hampered his ability to listen to nature's whispers. Carson and I developed a shorthand. Three blinks with our spotlights meant all clear. Two blinks were an invitation for coffee and chatter. That night had been solid three blink exchanges. I radioed in to report the odd noise when his aged voice crackled through. Saxton, you getting this tapping nonsense? Thought it was just me, I replied. There was comfort in knowing Carson heard it too. Solidarity in confusion, if nothing else. As morning broke, the tapping faded into memory until I found human-like tracks near the base of my tower, unshod feet too large for any person that danced across muddy terrain with no fear of the cold or debris. No one ventured out this far unprepared. It didn't make sense. I shared descriptions with Carson over coffee. Sounds like a mimicry artist, messing with us out there. His humor couldn't lift the tension seeping into my bones. That evening's patrols bore marks of disturbance, broken branches arching toward my tower with purposeful aggression, trash from campsites strewn about but no sign of campers. The isolation was casting doubts on my reason like never before. Days turned darker as subtle intrusions punctuated each night's silence, scuffling against wooden beams and shadows darting out of reach when discovered by flashlight. My uneasy sleep ruptured by grasping breaths nearby that held no source when sought out at dawn. It all came to a head one stifling night when through binoculars, I spied motion at Carson's tower. Flickering beams signaling three blinks yet shadowed figures skulked beneath his structure, as if savoring his obliviousness above. Saxton! They're here! Carson's voice trembled over the radio as reality set in. We weren't alone up here but both too far from help or each other. A plan formed rapidly, meet halfway, use our knowledge as defense. I locked the door, heart beating hard. Carson was miles away. I couldn't reach him in time. I had to call for help. Davis Peak, this is Saxton Tower. Emergency. Send someone fast. Copy Saxton Tower. What's your situation? Intruder at Carson's Tower, I said. I can't explain, but it's bad. The dispatcher promised quick action, but the distant patrol would take hours to reach us. Night fell and my isolation was complete. No sign of help yet. Then a loud crack echoed below my tower. It approached in steady bursts. It wasn't an animal, but something else that knew how to terrify. The creature appeared from the trees, its form huge and stooped. Muscles bunched under skin too tight for its frame. Its face was shadowed by the control room light, but I saw teeth, rows of them, shining dully in reflected light. It didn't see me immediately. It was fixated on ripping metal plates off the bottom of my tower. The structure shook with each pull. I remembered Carson, dialed his frequency. Carson! Get down! Get out now! His reply was cut short by a scream that ended abruptly. Communication died with static. Minutes passed with no word from Carson and none from help either. The creature now noticed my presence, turning its gaze up toward me, eyes devoid of anything human. It climbed effortlessly, reaching my floor quickly, its teeth gnashing inches from the reinforced glass. Sirens wailed in the distance, salvation but too far away. The glass started to crack under relentless pressure from outside. The door to the stairs gave way suddenly. Calls for help were no good anymore. I saw Carson's head amid debris opposite my tower window, confirming his fate. As the creature forced its way through broken glass, 
Law enforcement arrived below. Shouts filled the air get away from the window. It lunged at me just as bullets hit home. It stumbled backward into darkness beyond my sight. Morning revealed emergency teams securing both towers and tending to what remained of Carson below his shattered lookout point. Weeks later as I recovered in the hospital from deep cuts and a fractured leg, reports surfaced about an escaped scientific experiment from a private facility miles away. Something powerful they'd been growing that got out of control. They called it a genetic aberration. Those of us who survived knew it simply as horror made real. There was no closure, just memories of tapping echoes and those eyes full of malice that haunt to this day. Carson wasn't forgotten. He stands testament to human fragility when faced with monsters we create ourselves. I remember that morning like a snapshot, clear and crisp in my mind. I'm Clayton Mars, a trucker by trade, hauling across the lengths of the United States. On this particular run, I was headed towards the remote plains of Nebraska, driving a load that was both bulky and heavy, industrial parts for some farm equipment company out in the vast expanse of corn and wheat. The place has always made me uneasy. It's like you could scream at the top of your lungs and no one would be around to hear you. Land as far as the eye could see, scattered with old farmhouses that had seen better days. I've been through here enough times to know it like the back of my hand, yet it never felt like home. My dad used to tell me stories about his time in the service, how attention to detail could be the difference between life and death. I guess that stuck with me more than I realized because as I drove that day, something felt off. The air was too still, even for Nebraska. The first oddity was a lone car, abandoned on the side of the highway not uncommon, but this one was different. Its doors were wide open with luggage spilled all over. As if someone had left in a hurry, or been taken. As a trucker, you learn quickly when to stop and when to keep your eyes on the horizon and drive. Today was a day for driving. Hours passed with only the sound of the engine for company until I reached my destination by early evening, an isolated distribution center that matched the surrounding landscape, desolate and forgotten by time. I checked in with Hal Grissom an old-timer who ran these deliveries with efficiency but not much warmth. He walked with a limp from an injury long ago. He said it happened in a freak accident on one of these very docks but never elaborated further. I began unloading under Hal's watchful eye when out in the distance I saw movement. At first, it seemed like nothing more than prairie winds kicking up dust swirls, but soon it became apparent there was a man approaching from across the field. Tall and lean in stature, his clothes were nondescript but worn as though they'd clung to him through years of hard living. His face was another story, etched deep with lines that told tales of hardships suffered or caused. And his eyes— they were fixated on us with such intensity that even Hal noticed and muttered under his breath something about trouble. That's when Hal excused himself to make a call inside, presumably for help, leaving me outside to finish. And following protocol meant facing trouble head-on alone was part of the job description. So there I was, amidst towering stacks of freight, when this stranger began pacing at the perimeter like some predator stalking prey. Every instinct told me something unholy drove this man's presence here. He advanced steadily as time seemed to contort around us. My heart pounded in anticipation, while my hands kept moving almost mechanically. We were alone except for each other, and an unseen witness— fear itself stalking from silhouette shadows that lengthened as daylight died. I mentioned before about screaming into nothingness. Well, there's no cell service here to call anyone else for assistance, or even record what may come next. 
The tension escalated rapidly. One moment he was a safe distance away. The next he was close enough I could see something dark staining his fingers. Looking all too much like dried blood. Hal never came back outside, suggesting either his calls hadn't gone through or worse. Maybe he'd found trouble inside instead of waiting outside with me here now. I stood still, hoping my motionlessness would make me less of a target. The man stopped pacing and stared directly at me. His eyes, a steely gray, seemed almost hollow as they fixed on mine. In the dimming light, I saw more clearly the details of his worn face, marked by deep lines and a scar that ran across his left cheek. His dark hair was unkempt, and the thick beard did little to conceal his grim expression. The hands bearing the stain were clenched into fists, veins bulging at the surface. Suddenly he lunged forward, his movement almost a blur. He grabbed a pipe from the ground and swung it hard in my direction. I ducked just in time, feeling the rush of air as it narrowly missed my head and clanged against the metal container behind me. I ran through the maze of containers looking for an exit or a place to hide. Hal could have been anywhere. For all I knew, he was unconscious inside or had left me behind entirely. I didn't have my phone. It was in my bag inside the office, leaving me no way to call for help. I dodged another swing of the pipe. It grazed my shoulder before I found an unlocked shipping container and slipped inside, closing it with a soft click that I prayed wouldn't be heard. Hours passed, or perhaps it was minutes. Time disoriented me in that moment of survival. Eventually, I heard sirens in the distance followed by shouting and then silence. When police finally opened the container door, it felt like coming out of a tomb. They explained that Hal had called them before he was knocked out cold by our attacker. In that isolated area far from cell towers, his call barely got through but eventually brought help. Our attacker was gone. All they knew from Hal's description was that he was seeking vengeance after being laid off last month, and apparently decided I was responsible. They took Hal to receive medical attention as dawn broke over the terminal. Police found no other victims, some relief amidst chaos. As law enforcement assured they'd increase patrols and investigate further, all I could think of was how close I had come to being another nameless casualty in whatever twisted sense of justice drove that man's rage. The memory lingered long after of steel gray eyes filled with silent fury. A wound from mere inches could change everything. There's a violent orchestra that plays out in close calls too often ignored until its chorus crashes loud enough for all to hear. There are dangers we don't see until they stand right before us with blood-stained hands. My name is Tate. I never believed in urban legends. Those were stories for kids and gullible tourists. But working as a fire lookout in the rugged mountains of Montana... I faced a reality that chilled me to the core, an account no one would ever believe if I dared to tell it. I spent my days perched atop a steel tower that clawed at the sky, surveying acres of endless green pines stitched across the landscape like a colossal quilt. My only companions were radio chatter and the occasional visit from Martin, a ranger with an easy smile and jokes as dry as the summer earth. A few days ago, during a scorching August afternoon, my radio crackled alive with a distress call. A hiker named Genesa, voice quivering like a plucked guitar string, claimed something in the woods had taken her friend. Not an animal, she insisted. Her words tripped over themselves. Like a man, but wrong, silent steps. He was just gone. My pulse thrummed in my temples as I shouldered my pack and descended the tower. The dusky light painted long shadows between trunks as I reached Genesa at twilight. 
Her eyes darted through the trees like she was reading invisible signs. We set out searching, calling for her friend Rhett, but our voices seemed swallowed whole by the woods. With each step, unease settled heavier on my shoulders, like damp foliage until an eerie calm crept over us, a silencing of nature itself, as if we'd trespassed into some sacred, forsaken corridor of these ancient woods. As night drew its cloak tighter around us, we stumbled upon something macabre, Rhett's camera half-buried beneath pine needles. Its lens was shattered like a spider web, silver innards spilling into the mulch. On impulse more than hope, I pressed play on its cracked screen and heard Rhett's voice, casual at first but then rising in panic. His last words scuttled across my skin. What is that? Why can't it have eyes? Arden arrived not long after with reinforcements. He cast me a look that threatened to crumble my stoic facade, knowing yet questioning, as we huddled around that ominous recording which felt both violation and warning. The search continued for hours until dawn broke with no sign of Rhett or our faceless quarry, only one last unsettling discovery. Parallel grooves dug deep into the dirt, winding aimlessly through the underbrush as if something had dragged. Maybe he got lost and injured? Arden offered half-heartedly as we retreated from the woods' embrace. Maybe, I lied. With daylight's dominion restored, we chalked it up to wilderness hazards, the mundane threats of terrain and wildlife. But somewhere inside, fear had rooted itself like burrowing insects into bark. Tonight is different, though. The tower feels smaller somehow. Each creak of settling metal sounds deliberate, as if emulating footsteps ascending steel rungs with unhurried patience, a mimicry mastered by something that listens more than it sees. My gaze flits toward windows peppered with night's darkness where imagination shapes formless horrors from forest silhouettes. Retreat made sense. We left the forest behind, the grooves, the shattered camera, and Rhett's last words. None of us spoke of that recording. In town, I stayed with Arden and the others, windows locked tight and curtains drawn. We heard stories from others nearby. Pets vanished, fences destroyed, large patches of earth upturned. Never a sighting, just remnants of violent disturbance. A bear, people said, or some other stray beast pushed out of its natural habitat. Did they really believe it? Or was it easier than acknowledging those grooves that suggested agility and intent? Three days passed. Each night brought sounds, scraping against wood, a thump here and a crack there. Sleep was rare and restless. On the fourth night, Arden shook me awake to whispers of alarm in his house. Through the doorway something large passed, a shadow against the street light's faint glow through the windows. Its shape was wrong for a bear or any known creature to us, a torso elongated, limbs disproportionate in length, movements jerky yet silent on the grass outside. It paused as if sensing our gaze then moved on with purposeful strides toward the edge of town. We had our phones. We could call for help. But what would we report? The truth seemed too fantastical even for our own heirs. No one else needed to face this thing. We huddled inside until morning light spilled over us like a protective shroud. By then it was gone, no trace but memories that clung like burrs. No one mentioned Red again after that week. His parents moved away. His room stayed empty the town's unspoken monument to what we'd encountered and couldn't explain. I left town too eventually. Not because I thought I could escape what happened, but because staying among silent questions and hidden terror was a torture in itself. Now I sit long hours under the sun in crowded places where shadows are merely shadows, 
even if sometimes my eyes trick me into seeing grooves dug into earth far from any tree line or seeing limbs too long to belong to anything human scramble across distant ridges. It still roams out there, that much I believe, but I don't hunt for answers, and I don't dig up past horrors best left buried with broken cameras beneath pine needles. I'd been living in a fire lookout tower in the Monongahela National Forest for three seasons, relishing the solitude and the unbroken swaths of nature stretching beyond my perch. My name, Fletcher Reed, wasn't one you'd stumble across often. Among the verdant waves of trees and the ashen aftermath of old fires, my job was simple. Watch for smoke, report fires, keep the forest safe. One clear evening, as the sun cast amber light on the horizon, I spotted something puzzling through my binoculars. Not smoke, but an irregular cluster of birds abandoning a section of the woods in a flustered mass. I marked the coordinates and decided to investigate at first light. Dawn brought with it a sliver of dread as I descended to find out what had ruffled feathers enough to leave en masse. The air was crisp and unusually still as I hiked with purpose across varying terrain. Silence draped over me like a chilling fog. Not even the scampering of small animals graced my ears. Upon arrival at the site, I found no fire but a scene that skewered any normalcy, an arrangement of deer carcasses in an eerily organized fashion forming an unknown symbol on the forest floor. Each deer was untouched by scavengers. This wasn't nature's doing but rather a work cold and methodic. I took photos before making my way back to report it. Back in my tower, as twilight approached and shadows clawed their way across the landscape, unease nestled into every creek and grind of wood settling for the night. The walkie-talkie persisted in static silence until a crackle broke through. Only it wasn't dispatch on the other line, but a distorted sequence of numbers mimicking a voice. 4728 I chalked it up to interference from somewhere else, somewhere far from my lonely heights. Dinner passed with quips shared with friends over texts to distract myself, humor like an inadequate shield against encroaching fear. I was about to settle down when movement flickered at the edge of vision. It was there again, that same disturbance I had seen through binoculars earlier. But now it was closer, too close for comfort or comprehension. Acting on instinct more than logic, I locked up and grabbed my flashlight before cautiously stepping outside. As clouds received the moon's glow into their embrace, illuminating traces below revealed prints that were either human nor any recognizable animal. The hairs on my neck stood taut. Goose flesh wasn't mythology but corporeal testimony that something was wrong here. Terribly so. Underneath me, wooden planks complained bitterly about my every movement as I followed those prints leading away from my sanctum toward unknown peril. Toward whatever unspeakable entity left behind that cryptic sign made out of Bambi's kin. Just then... An abrupt commotion split the homely hum of insects. Rocks tumbled down somewhere ahead near an especially dense congregation of fir trees that obscured what thrived within their midst. There seemed to be whispers carried upon faint swirling winds, a teasing semblance of speech or maybe warning cries from woodland wraiths. I hesitated, my hand tight on the flashlight, ready to dial for help but I second-guessed the signal here, remote as it was, and the thing that rustled in the trees could cut me down before a word left my mouth. Help was too far off to place faith in. The fir trees shook with force as something emerged. It stood on two feet, height formidable, covered in thick fur that bristled with every breath it drew. Eyes did not gleam or glow. They were but deeper shadows within the dark shape that towered over me. The creature bore claws, 
evidence clear in the gashed bark and air that dripped with fresh sap where it had passed. It lunged suddenly, a snarl ripping through the night's veil. I turned, not daring a second glance, heart pounding as I sprinted back to my cabin. The door slammed behind me, barricaded with all I could muster against such strength. The night dragged on, each creak and groan of what a signal of potential breach. There were crashes outside, proof of its frustration or perhaps delight. It wasn't content to leave without having tasted fear or flesh. At dawn's first light, through windows I dared not unshield completely, there lay destruction's path, trees scarred, earth torn up where massive feet had churned mud. Flashes of security lights showed me glimpses of retreat, a hulking figure disappearing into nature's heart where man's reach grew thin. Police arrived hours later to reports of a bear, a logical conclusion for them but knowledge sat heavy on my shoulders. That thing bore bulk beyond any bear's girth and moved with purpose rather than animalistic need. They found Tom from over the ridge, shredded. Tears demanded to fall for such an end but I steeled myself, for if fear got its hold once more, it would never let go. I left that place soon after with whispers behind me not of tragedy but of a wild gone wrong where humanity is not hunter but hunted. Tom's name whispered in respect for his unintended sacrifice. I drove away from mountains that house secrets beyond understanding, forever marked by an encounter that logic shuns but survival will never forget. My breath clouded in the chill air as I patrolled the perimeter of my domain a vast stretch of wilderness in Montana's rugged terrain that feeds the soul with silence and solitude. I was a fire lookout, vigilant against the threat of wildfires, my eyes ever scanning the horizon for the merest hint of smoke. It was a job that suited me, Adriel Maynard, preferring isolation over banter, quiet observation over idle chatter. The landscape lay cloaked in twilight's embrace when I noticed something unsettling, a pattern amid nature that did not belong. Drag marks leading away from the base of a gnarled pine tree, distinct against the underbrush. I radioed it in, my voice steady despite the knot tightening in my gut. Marlin, from dispatch, replied with customary indifference. Probably just hunters, he drawled. Determined to leave no stone unturned, I followed the signs until I stumbled upon a scene that shattered the silent calm, a deer carcass splayed grotesquely across the forest floor. But no predator of this world would leave behind such chaos. The bites were precise, surgical almost. Days rolled into weeks. My only company was brief radio check-ins and occasional hikers passing through. People like Ezra Grafton or Lena Keen, rare names for transient souls whom I met briefly then watched disappear back into civilization. I kept my vigil as autumn blazed into winter, trees shedding their vibrant hues like old memories. That's when it happened again, the gruesome find. This time it was two dead elk near an icy stream, pristine and undisturbed save for the same telltale bite marks. Strange occurrences became my routine companion, subtle noises after dusk, unnerving moments where shadows seemed to breathe and move of their own accord, but yet nothing tangible to prove I wasn't alone out here. One evening as twilight merged with the darkness of an impending storm front, bizarre laughter teased my ears, a mirthless sound that didn't belong to any known creature. My pulse quickened as cold sweat slicked my skin. Just the wind, I convinced myself. But isolation has a way of peeling away reasons like layers from an onion until only raw truth remains. The laughter was real. I sat at my desk one night in mid-November composing logs when taps fractured the silence, rapid and deliberate against my windowpane. 
grudging glare from my lantern revealed nothing but slittering mist outside. Hey, Adriel. Marlin's voice crackled over the handset during our nightly check-in days later. Strange stories bubbling up down here about wildlife acting all skewed near your area. You keeping an eye out? The jest in his tone didn't mask my growing sense of unease. I knew better than to dismiss local lore rooted in years of experience. Hunters and hikers spoke in hushed tones about deer found bloodless, corpses desiccated beyond natural explanation. With each passing day, anxiety clawed at me more insistently, a primal alarm that urged constant vigilance. My eyes darted ceaselessly through scopes and binoculars looking for something, anything, that might reveal this elusive menace. Then tonight unfolded, the air punctuated by an unseasonable chill as moonlight lay fractured by skeletal branches overhead. A rustle broke through ambient forest murmurings drawing my gaze downward where hazy silhouettes melded into undergrowth, slow movements, intentional and controlled too large to be any ordinary creature native to these parts. I locked eyes on the movement below. My hand steadied the radio. Marlin, I whispered. I need backup. The line crackled to life. On my way, Marlin responded. His calm betrayed no worry, yet urgency underpinned his words. I moved from the window, seeking refuge under my desk heart hammering against my ribs. The tapping resumed, no longer a question of mere curiosity, but a clear threat, a demand for entry. Minutes inched by when a scream shattered the night's facade. It sounded human but held a timbre that suggested more, something other. The door flew off hinges, splinters scattered across the room. A beast strode through the frame, its form obscured by darkness but its presence unmistakable in its enormity and purpose. Thick sinew flexed beneath what seemed like matted fur, its limbs ended in claws that rendered wood and metal like clay. Marlin burst through what remained of the doorway with two others. They bore rifles in their grips, their faces set in grim determination. Get behind us! Marlin barked without glancing back. Shots broke out as I crawled to safety behind them. The sound was deafening, more so than any storm that had graced these lands. The beast roared, lumbering forward undeterred by the assault of bullets that might fell any natural creature. Its maw gaped to reveal rows of serrated teeth as it reached for the man nearest to it. Thompson, the youngest among us, staggered backward with a guttural cry. Flesh tore from his shoulder in vicious strips as he fell. Blood painted the floorboards beneath him during his final moments. Their aim turned desperate, each shot punctuated with silent prayers against an entity we were unprepared to meet. And then silence claimed us all. Men and creature alike manic moments paused as if catching breath before calamity's next act. Marlin's eyes met mine, communication without words before he nodded at me, a signal devised from years of service together, and I seized the chance to flee toward the tree lean as their gunfire provided cover. I heard more screams, the sound scrabbling after me, but never looked back, driven only by survival's instinctual tide until cabin lights guided me home hours later where reinforcement awaited pale faces echoing fear felt and seen. Disbelief written on every line despite evidence dripping from claw marks etched deep into flesh and wood. They never found Marlin or the others. Nature reclaimed her secrets with disquieting ease while whispers of what lurked within these woods grew bolder among survivors recounting their tale. A story etched in sorrow with Thompson's grave standing testament to nights when death's shadow wears fur and bone. I remember vividly the summer I took the job as a fire lookout at Desolation Peak in Washington. 
It was supposed to be a time of solace, a chain of serene days watching over an expanse of wilderness. My name? It's Booker Treadwell. Most folks stick to book for short. The incident happened on my fourth week there. By that time, I'd settled into a routine, spending daylight hours scanning the horizon, my nights buried in old mysteries and sipping lukewarm coffee. That night was different, though. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was awry. I'd grown familiar with the nocturnal sounds around the tower. But this sound, it was an unsettling clattering coming from the dark pines like broken glass under heavy boots. Rarely did hikers venture this high after dusk. It just didn't make sense. Curiosity bested caution and I grabbed my flashlight, venturing out onto the rough-hewn steps that led down from my perch. My search led me to a chilling sight at the tree lean. Several deer lay mutilated, not as if by any predator I knew but with precision that suggested malicious intent. It struck me something human could have done this, but who and why would plague me? The following days, each brought its own disturbing discovery. Scattered personal belongings, remnants of shredded maps pinpointing other watchtowers, almost as if tracking someone or something moving through these woods with purpose. Each time, I reported back to base camp, they sent up a warden by the name of Delia Krantz. She had sharp instincts and a steely demeanor underlined by quick wit that cut through tension like nothing else. A deft investigator, she scoured scenes with meticulous care while jotting notes in a weathered notebook. Our conversations were straightforward. We'd discuss possibilities over walkie-talkies when she descended back into trees again on another Leeds trail. I wanted to help more but my primary duty was to spot fires and keep watch from above. One evening Delia called and agitated. She described finding a makeshift camp littered with surveillance equipment aimed at my tower. My skin crawled realizing whoever we were dealing with had been watching me. That night as darkness suffocated every inch of light outside, power cut out in my tower inexplicably. An unshakable silence sank its teeth into the room. That's when I saw it, amid piercing darkness, glinting binoculars from below reflected moonlight as they swayed ever so slightly. A tall figure emerged from shadows stepping deliberately across debris without any concern for noise they made now. They weren't trying to be stealthy anymore. They knew I was trapped up here alone. I barricaded myself in but it wasn't long before thuds against wooden entryway echoed through confined space threatening intrusion any minute now. My heart kept time with each pound as creature. No, this person worked diligently to reach me. I reached for the radio. Static hissed back, no connection. They must have tampered with it. No means to call for help now. I had to think fast. The thuds grew louder as the figure forced their way in. The door gave in with a final splintering crash. Moonlight revealed the intruder. Not a warden, not a hiker, something else. It stood over six feet tall, its matted fur clung to skin in clumps smeared with soil and what seemed like blood. Eyes too bright, too intelligent caught mine before it lunged. It threw itself against the furniture I had piled up. I retreated into the far corner, my breath shallow and rapid, my eyes never leaving the movement by the door as it systematically dismantled my defenses. The creature or person grabbed shelves, flinging them aside with a strength that made it clear I stood no chance in direct confrontation. Equipment scattered on impact. Maps fluttered like birds caught in a storm. Then Delia's voice crackled through the radio on the floor it had come back to life. In panic, I shouted her name. She must have been close. Her reply was swift and clear. Stay put, she ordered. The creature stopped, head tilting as if considering this new development, giving me precious seconds. Delia arrived, gun drawn, 
face set in grim determination. Shots rang out. They seemed to merely graze the creature as it retreated into the shadows with an unearthly snarl of pain, or maybe anger. Blood marked its trail. It was wounded but not down. In silent consensus, we didn't pursue but secured the tower instead and waited for backup at dawn. In the morning light, they found torn remains of someone from town known for wildlife trafficking who must have confounded us all. Human cruelty mistaken for a legend's malice. I didn't see Delia after that night. Reports said she transferred out west. Sometimes I catch myself staring into woods wondering if that person could have been consumed by their obsession if they became more beast than human out there. As for me, I still keep watch over these woods from my tower. Eyes not just looking for fires anymore but something else that might lurk below.